Kia ora koutou, no mai, haere mai, and welcome to this CapEx Framework Workshop as part of the process to reset the default price quality path for electricity distributors. My name is Dane Kano, I'm the Head of Price Quality Regulation here in the Infrastructure Branch at the Commerce Commission. I'd like to open the workshop today with a karakia uh, before moving on through a brief introduction, and I'll hand over to my colleagues who will introduce themselves and take you through the rest of what we've got planned for today. Whakataka te ho ki te uru, whakataka te ho ki te tonga, ki a mākinakina ki uta, ki a mātaratara ki tai, ehi aka ana te atakura, he tio, he huka, he hohu, te hei mauri ora. So, the purpose today is pretty simple. We want to share more of our thinking on the key components of the CapEx framework, hear your thoughts, and also provide an opportunity for you to follow up with some of your further thinking and written submissions ahead of our draft decision in May. Bit of a disclaimer here, uh, none of the analysis presented today is intended to be representative of allowances at the draft or final decision stage. It's illustrative for the purpose of discussion on the framework settings. Uh, the same applies to any views we may present uh, today as staff at the Commission. We're not the decision makers, and we've yet to present any recommendations to commissioners who will ultimately decide the outcomes in this process. So, Hopefully you've all got uh, the materials that we circulated ahead of the workshop. Uh, so just a few things to quickly cover. Uh, we won't be talking to everything we provide in advance. Uh, some of the materials were for context, and we'll be focusing on the topics we think will benefit the most from in-person discussion today. You can, however, submit on anything on the CapEx framework as part of your submissions and the follow-up to the workshop. The workshop is being recorded for transparency and will be published on our website at the close. However, this doesn't apply to the breakout sessions that we've got planned. I think by now, following COVID and a lot of uh, online uh, work and the years that have followed, we're all pretty familiar with online meeting etiquette, but just note uh, the points that we'll be using today, which is on mute, camera off and they're speaking, uh, use the raise hand function um, and also the Teams chat will be monitored if you do want to put through questions. Uh, you'll be assigned to a breakout room for the group discussions um, and we'll explain how these work closer to when those occur. I've just got a note handed to me uh, about a technical correction. I'll just pause now just to have a chat with my team. Apologies for that. We're back and we're back with the workshop agenda. Uh, so it's going to be an intro session first that kind of goes through uh, the broad approach to uh, setting uh, allowances. Uh, then we'll, we'll then move into the specifics around how we assess uh, CapEx forecasts and then have a look in the last session about some of the other factors that we may need to take account of in setting the revenues. Um, and then we'll have a closeout at the end. 
Um, before I hand over to Simon uh, for the next session, uh, I've just got a, a few comments I'd like to make on the broader context for this workshop. Uh, so resets are obviously massive for us here at the Commission, uh, and it's clear to us that the stakes are much higher for this one uh, than previous resets. I've always thought they're important, but this one is very important for us to get right for electricity consumers and the country as a whole. A lot of the context for the reset was discussed at length as part of our recent IM review, uh, and the DPP4 challenge has been exercising our minds for some time now. We're not wedded to past approaches and accept that for consumers to get the network they need at the right time, higher allowances may be justified, and we'll have to rely on judgment where information is imperfect. However, there remains significant uncertainty, and whilst we're focusing on the CapEx framework for ex ante revenue setting today, it'd be remiss of me not to mention that the DPP may not be the best tool to deal with every instance. We've already made changes to the scope and operation of reopeners and expect to have a greater reliance on these in-period adjustments going forward. The regime also provides that for larger and more business-specific challenges, a customised price quality path is an option. In both reopeners and CPPs, we understand that these are not costless exercises for the businesses and we're conscious of being efficient and proportionate in our response. Over to you, Simon. Thanks, Dane. Uh, Maureen, everyone. My name is Simon Wakefield. I'm a principal advisor within the price quality regulation team here at the Commerce Commission. And I'm going to be running through the next session, which is uh, about setting CapEx allowances within a DPP, including use of the 2023 Asset Management Plan Review. So there's three key parts of the session we're focusing on today, which is laying out at a high level the context and challenges for setting CapEx allowances within a DPP, uh, providing an introduction to the CapEx framework, which will be taken through by my colleague Trung Flett, and providing some views on how the 2023 Asset Management Plan Review undertaken by IAE uh, could be accommodated within the CapEx framework. Uh, I note this session doesn't have discussion questions, uh, but we can, we can ask clarifying comments as we go along. So now I've moved on to uh, what is a stylized representation of the work we're going to be performing in establishing CapEx allowances. So I note the slide's non-exhaustive. Um, it's difficult to get everything we need to do in setting CapEx allowances on a page. But if we start with the top, start with the aim. Um, so the DPP like all of our EDB-focused work programs uh, within the Commission, needs to be undertaken on a basis consistent with the Section 52A purpose statement. And so in shorthand, that means we focus on promoting the long-term benefits of consumers by providing suppliers incentives to innovate and invest, incentives to improve efficiency and provide services at a quality that consumers demand, share with consumers the benefits of efficiency gains, and that suppliers are limited in their ability to extract excessive profits. And the Commission in doing that has to balance competing uh, objectives within the 52A purpose statement. So we move down to the setting. This is part of what Dane touched on, of that the purpose of default, price, default customised price quality regulation is to provide a relatively low cost way of setting price quality paths for suppliers of regulated goods or services, while allowing the opportunity for individual regulated suppliers to have alternative price quality paths that might better meet their particular circumstances. So there's a couple of key points to focus on there. Uh, so relatively low cost. So that's an important consideration for the design of our CapEx framework, and the application of this will be discussed throughout the workshop. I note that when we're thinking about relatively low cost, we consider the efficiency, complexity, and cost of the DPP regime as a whole when resetting the DPP. So that would include potential costs of uh, reopener applications. We've also got the role of customised price quality paths and the intention that these are available as an alternative price quality path that better meets an EDB circumstances. So we've recently completed the IM review and that had a significant focus on ensuring CPPs are appropriately accessible, including the role of modification and exemptions to requirements and the requirements themselves. The next row along is about work program considerations. So they, these considerations broadly align with the types of considerations which EDBs will have applied themselves in developing expenditure forecasts. The distinction being that EDBs will typically build up uh, their CapEx forecasts on a project by project basis, but that detailed level of assessment is inconsistent with a relatively low cost framework. 
So moving across, we have the confirming need. So one of our key roles is to establish the need for 16 businesses with varying sizes, asset conditions and consumer expectations and the challenge involved in that. It's going to have both a business as usual component, the repairs and replacement, and the increased focus on electrification. We then have to think about whether the forecasts and allowances of the expenditure are consistent with that need. And so the appropriateness of transferring the need or demand into its planned expenditure. And that's going to think about the different views and the availability of non-network solutions and the ability for that to mitigate uh, potential capex spend in the short term. And then moving to the next uh, row along is forecasting a program that is deliverable. So that's determining deliverability of a program has always been relevant for us, uh, but it's particularly relevant where we have increased work program sizes being forecast. And then lastly, enabling flexibility where needed. So it's making sure we are appropriately using our flexibility mechanisms. So we do have reopeners and CPPs and the innovation and non-traditional solutions allowance and making sure that our CapEx framework works well with those available mechanisms. And lastly, at the bottom, we've got a specific point around efficient investment. So it's an important consideration for both setting the allowance and the ongoing incentives during the DPP regime. It's really important that we encourage uh, EDBs to make efficient decisions. And that was reflected in a previous workshop we held around forecasting and incentivizing efficient investment. But we note that our uh, CapEx forecasting approach isn't going to approve specific investments. So we don't look at the specific, whether each individual investment is specifically efficient. Um, it's not how the DPP regime works, but the, deep, the whole regime is built around a range of tools which work together to incentivize efficient investment for the long-term benefit of consumers. So these tools include setting the path, but also the operation of a revenue cap, which incentivizes the EDBs to find more efficient solutions to the, to the extent that those are of a lower cost. Uh, the CPPs and reopeners, the expenditure incentives themselves, so the CapEx IRIS, quality standards and incentives, uh, the innovation and non-traditional solutions allowance, and our information disclosure requirements. So a fair amount to take in, but that's kind of trying to get it on a slide. Right. There's a few initial points here in terms of setting uh, CapEx allowances for the DPP. So the three initial points on the slide reiterate some of the context from the previous slide. Um, we're very mindful in uh, setting a DPP of the context we're in, that we're in an energy transition, that there's a high level of uncertainty and need, timing and costs for some investments, and that EDBs are also faced with additional choices that are subject to greater uncertainty and may involve a wider range of solutions. The two bullets at the end here touch on key feedback we've received on the DPP4 issues paper, but also preceding that. And the submissions submitted on the need to shift away from an aggregate cap on forecast capex of 120%, and that emerging drivers in DPP4 are likely to mean that allowances in DPP4 will need to be higher than previous resets. On that point, for those familiar with DPP3, or when we refer to DPP3 and DPP4, uh, DPP4 is the fourth time we've been resetting uh, price quality pass for EDB businesses. So DPP3 is the current uh, period which EDBs are in. A number of that will be familiar to a lot of you, but just checking that terminology. Um, for those familiar with the DPP3 process, some of the approach and framework we discussed today will appear familiar, and we've outlined their rationale for that. However, we're not restricted by the processes and settings which we applied in DPP3. Some settings may not be relevant and could be removed or applied with different metrics or against different thresholds. But we also note that underlying movements in the metrics which support certain criteria may support high allowances of themselves. We've appreciated all the submissions we've received as part of our process to date and related submissions which we received as other parts of our process, including the IM review. This slide uh, represents a selection of submissions, which do pull out some of the key themes, but it's certainly not exhaustive of all the issues and potential topics we heard on as part of our issues paper. So uh, particular points to focus on here is the reflection of the significant increase in investment required in this period and the potential impacts if that's not accommodated within the DPP, with some related views on ensuring the appropriateness of investment, particularly ensuring the appropriate consideration and application of non-network solutions. There's also uh, a couple of points there around our ability for the DPP to accommodate scale of change in expenditure, which I just covered, but also um, questions around the Commission's ability to accommodate what could potentially be a larger range of CPPs and or reopeners and our ability to process those. Lastly, just point out uh, there's a, an apologise for a typo, typo at the bottom. It says Infrastructure Commission uh, or Te Wahanga. That should, that's actually a quote from Infrastructure New Zealand. So apologies for that.
So in undertaking our work and setting CapEx allowances, we're mindful of the value we provide by scrutinizing expenditure forecasts. We apply a principle of proportionate scrutiny, which means we focus on those areas where our scrutiny is likely to make the most difference. In the context of CapEx, this means our focus is on setting CapEx allowances, which are consistent with the long-term benefit of consumers. Allowing EDBs to set their own CapEx forecast without review or challenge may create a risk of inflated forecasts, inf investments that are needed but might not be delivered, and excessive prices for consumers. However, providing CapEx allowances such that the total of expenditure provided is too low means many suppliers would need to utilize uh, the available and flexibility mechanisms, including reopeners and CPPs, or may not undertake required investments. I'll now hand over to my colleague, Tran Flett, to talk to the process for setting CapEx allowances and introduce the CapEx framework. Kia ora, uh, my name is Trang Flett. I'm a Chief Advisor in the Electricity Distribution Business Team. Apologies for that. <laughs> I had myself on mute. Um, so, kia ora, my name is Trang Flett. Sorry. Oh, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, um, we so, can. Great. Um, so my name is Trang Flett. I'm a chief advisor um, in the electricity distribution, like uh, electricity distribution business team um, within the commission. Um, this slide here uh, provides a high-level summary of the steps to setting capex allowances, which we included in our issues paper. So over the past couple of months, uh, we've refined our thinking based on our analysis of information provided by EDBs and other external sources, including the report prepared by IANGE uh, on EDB AMPs. Um, so our analysis and our emerging thinking uh, is summarised in the next slide. So this diagram provides a more granular view of our emerging process for setting capital allowances. Um, you know, the, the identify, adjust and determine boxes from the previous slide. So our emerging view is that it continues to make sense given the relatively low cost nature of, of our regime to use higher level tests based on simple screening metrics and scrutiny thresholds to identify which forecasts to scrutinize further. So those are boxes one and two. Um, given the relatively low cost nature of the regime, the scrutiny we can apply to expenditure that exceeds the set threshold will be limited. It'll be a relatively high level and unlikely to go down to project level in most cases. This in turn means that there will be expenditure that is too complex, detailed or large for us to consider when setting capex, capex allowances for DPP purposes, even though they may be in the long-term interest of consumers that the investment occurs. The level of scrutiny for those types of investments may be more appropriate for reopening of CPP. So that's boxes three, four and five. When setting capex allowances, we need to consider the uncertainty in the forecast and whether they should be considered using one of the flexibility mechanisms available in the regime, which is box three there. We note um, that the recent IM review amended existing or introduced new mechanisms in response to the emerging drivers and the investment uncertainty that these can create for EDPs. So things like timing, scale, nature and location. The focus of the workshop is to involve you in our design process and thinking. We've organised a workshop around the key areas of, of tests that we could use to assess forecast expenditure, the level or type of additional scrutiny we could apply, and how, can we, how we can account for uncertainty when setting CAPEX allowances. As we go through the workshop, we'll use the diagram above to show where the session fits within our assessment process, so you can see how your feedback will help us shape our approach. So I'll hand back to... Um, I'll hand back to Simon, who's going to take you through some of the findings from the AMP23 review. Thanks, Trung. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm now going to take you through the findings from the 2023 Asset Management Plan Review, which was undertaken by IAE uh, out of Australia. All right, uh, so 
We've recently published the independent uh, review of the 2023 asset management plans undertaken by IAE. And given the likely interest in how the report would be utilised, we published a staff letter outlining how we considered it may be used within the CAPEX framework and for forecasting OPEX. The slide, this slide summarises the approach undertaken by IAE. And it's important to note the IAE report provides an opinion on the demand and expenditure forecasting practices outlined in EDB's AMPS, but the report was not intended to verify expenditure forecasts contained within the AMPS and therefore does not provide an opinion on whether expenditure forecasts are reasonable. We note for some EDBs significant variations in expenditure forecasts between 2024 information submitted in response to our 53ZD notice and the 2023 asset management plans provides further complexity in applying the review findings within a CAPEX framework. The IAE quote here reflected in red reasonably represents some, but not all of the challenges which IAE faced, which are summarised in the staff letter and are detailed within the IAE report. What we've outlined here is our initial view, that the report provides an overall view that non-exempt EDB's CAPEX forecasting approaches, as explained in their AMPs, broadly align with good industry practice, and that them, that could be a consideration for how thresholds are set, set within the CAPEX allowance. But information regarding certainty and reasonable forecasts for future growth drivers also may be a consideration in setting thresholds. We note for those who have read the report, the attachment to the report assesses specific categories of expenditure for certain ADBs and has other relevant pieces of information, i.e. potential triggers for step changes, key dependencies, and risks associated with the forecasts and particular sensitivities of forecasts. The impact of these is described, but not quantified. So our emerging view is that they can inform the framework setting rather than being specific components of the CAPEX framework themselves. Dale? Yeah, sure. Uh, Dale. Hi, my question uh, related to the previous slide. Um, the Commission's indicating um, that they will actually consider as part of their assessment process whether something meets a flexibility. Um, so part of my uh, two questions, one is, does this would that be an indication to an EDB that the Commission would effectively be kind of pre-qualifying a certain group of expenditure for re-opener? Um, and secondly, uh, as a principle, does the Commission consider it is better to forecast um, customer decarbonisation projects in the AMP or pull them out and treat them as re-openers? So great questions, Dale. I think there was sort of two parts to that. Um, so I'll start with the second part. Is it um, that within the AMP, is it useful to identify specific uh, investments? It definitely would be useful useful to have clearly identified within the AMP and re recognise where people are in the AMP process time and currently. So it may be an additional supporting information. Those investments which are more uncertain. Uh, when you and so we might be looking for sort of additional disclosures to really be able to pull that out. I think when you're talking through the capex framework there. Our reference to reopeners is to really be aware of the role of those flexibility mechanisms within the DPP regime when we set allowances. So if we're applying a threshold cap, we need to kind of have a, a mind to do the nature of the investments, which we are arguably, which might exceed the threshold. Would they be well suited to a reopener? And so there's thinking about kind of the level of spend. <clears throat> and if you uh, work through, would not approving the expenditure now, would there be more information, <clears throat> excuse me, available at a later time, which would, would give greater certainty that it would be appropriate to spend and sort of al allow that allowance? So it's really thinking about ensuring that we're aware of the role of the flexibility mechanisms within setting allowances and that we've appropriately thought them through, rather than sort of predetermining that there would be uh, sort of a set listing within the DPP sort of saying we've declined these projects and that these projects would be sort of appropriate for reopeners. We may not get there. It is more in thinking that if we are applying materiality thresholds and then expenditure forecasts go above uh, those materiality thresholds, what does that mean in terms of do the investments seem more uncertain and so maybe more appropriate for a reopener and that will set further into the future? Or do we potentially need to do further work now because they may not be well suited for re to determine whether they could be accommodated within a DPP allowance? Okay, thank you.
Thanks for that question, Dale. That was, you know, greatly appreciated. Um, we are um, now moving into kind of the, the end of the session. Um, we are interested in your views uh, on the asset management plan review. We're sure there will be some. Um, we're particularly interested in how they can be taken into account within the CAPEX framework. As I noted, the staff letter uh, outlines in a bit of detail how we think it could be accommodated, and that will flow into the work which we talk about today. Um, but if you have further views um, on either the report itself or in its findings, um, these can be provided as part of the submission process associated with this workshop, which we'll be outlining at the, at the close of this session. So we're now moving to session two, uh, which will explain our key under our understanding of the key drivers for expenditure, how we've used these to identify potential metrics and initial staff thinking on how these metrics could be used to inform CAPEX allowances. However, I would just like to pause there and see if there are any further questions arising from session one. Okay. So I don't think we've received any questions on that one. So we'll move into the next session, which is on time, which is always fantastic. Um, just moving along our slides. Yes. Yep. Excellent. Uh, so. This highlighted slide indicates where on our CapEx framework we are currently focusing on. So now I'll hand over to Tobias, who'll be leading this part of the session. Good morning, everyone. Um, Tobias Mauk, um, Principal Advisor in the PQT at the uh, Commerce Commission. Um, and um, I'm not going to spend um, time on this slide. I will move straight to the next one. Um, so in this part of the session, um, we'll talk about the insights that have shaped the Commission staff's emerging views on the CapEx framework. Just to reiterate, these are staff views. They're not um, our Commissioner's views. And um, I'll start by providing some uh, brief overall insights. Um, um, in, on aggregate, and then then I'll hand over to Trang and Peter for the specific insights that are reflected in our emerging view capex framework. Um, so if you move to the next slide, um, this this is not a, going to be a big surprise to anyone. The um, first thing to note is really that non EDBs, non exempt EDBs, are planning to increase capex significantly from historical levels. So they're going from about 1 billion a year to, to about 1.5, 1.6 billion over the DPP, according to draft 2024 AMP figures. Um, the other thing to notice is that these numbers have been subject to quite a bit of variability, um, particularly since 2020, uh, the 2023 AMP. Um, the 2023 AMP is, is notable, notable in that it's the first time that that large uplift in expenditure has been um, signaled that that large uplift in need has been signaled. Um, we've also understand from um, discussion with with EDBs that partly this was driven by regulatory reasons. Um, so we were told that some EDBs included in their amps what they thought they needed, not what they thought they needed, but what they thought the commission might um, might allow. So that that explains some of it. Um, but when we then look at the um, the next AMP, which is the, the draft um, 2024 AMP numbers, um, the there has been again quite a bit of variability. So, so our view is that it's not just that um, that for, for regulatory reasons that that the AMP has been has been changing year on year. It's also because of significant uncertainty. So, so in the la last um, in the draft AMP, we've been seeing again. Six EDBs increasing their capex by by over thirty percent, and and one reducing it by by thirty percent. So, so there's there's quite a lot of uncertainty about the need um, over the DPP four period. Um, moving now to the next slide. Um, our our emerging view remains that the AMP is the most um, 
Um, yes, I've got a, a hand up from from Dale here. I'd, um, please um, go ahead. Hi, um, just on that last slide, uh, did the um, commission's consultants consider whether there was an element of deferral from DPP3 because of the high levels of, of inflation into the 2023 AMP? Um, that is a question. That's a very good question. I don't have an answer for that specifically. Um, I don't know if you have, Simon. Uh, to the extent that the, that information may have been represented within the asset management plan itself to say that was the reason for the expenditure forecast. So, yeah, the review was focused on the information contained within the asset management plans. So if there was a representation of a certain level of deferral, then that will come through. Uh, I haven't seen a lot in the report to indicate that that was a substantial that is the substantial driver of the increase. Um, it is yeah, predominantly the the dry, the new emerging drivers was the predominant mm. reason for the forecast capex coming through. OK. Thank you, Dave. Um, so the AMPs do remain our, our best um, starting point for setting capex allowances, and that's not a surprise. We've been doing this in um, DPP1, DPP2 and DPP3 as well. Um, but it's it's worth noting that the the asset management plans and and the mobility across years does does indicate that um, clearly to us that amps are not um, the same as expenditure proposals. There's 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 a lot of flexibility in how amps uh, are being prepared, uh, uh, the scope that's being included, and so that they're not the same um, as as an expenditure proposal, such as a CPP or an IPP. Um, and and um, moving now to the, the the next big big observation. Um, sorry, not the next slide. We, we stay in this slide. Um, the next um, key point is that during during the AMP twin, during the IM uh, review twenty three IM review, we had um, some some views that suggested that the the reason is is quite quite simple. Why expenditure is going up? Um, we we think that. There isn't a single simple reason for why expenditure is going up, um, and that's clearly um, that that's very clear when we're reading reading your asset management plan. So, um, the during the review, BCG, for example, suggested that the um, all, all of the expenditure there was a 22 billion uh, number uh, being used, which is totex during from 2020 to 23. Um, um, was related to, to the need to decarbonize and electrify. Um, so when we look at your asset management plans, there is there's a whole bunch of reasons why um, expenditure is, is going up and is not exclusively um, because of decarbonization and electrification. More recently, some EDBs have suggested that a big reason for the increase in in um, expenditure is not not actually um, uh, increases in volume or, or different types of vessels that are being constructed, but it's increases in costs. We think there is um, some um, that that's partly part of the reason, uh, but we think it's not not the only reason. So we think that costs might, well, will have gone up, um, and but also that volumes will have gone up, and volumes will have gone up not just because of the need to electrify and decarbonize, but also because of you know traditional reasons such as renewals. And, and importantly, the reason varies significantly across EDBs. So um, we think there isn't a simple explanation for your for your expend for EDB distributors' expenditure needs, and but it varies a lot. And what that means for us is that um, this isn't going to be an easy review. And so we really appreciate the, that you've taken time today to engage with us and to give us your brains to um, further our, our CAPEX framework. Um, um, now we move to the next slide and then, then uh, the next one again. Um, so this is uh, just a, a very brief overview that the, the needs vary significantly across um, distributors. So we see some, some EDBs uh, uh, plans are dominated by a consumer connection and growth, and for some, it's it's renewals, and there's a there's a lot in between. 
moving now to the next slide. Um, what uh, the information that you provided to us as part of um, and 53 ZD notice, we found it very, very helpful um, because it allows us to understand better the the drivers for you, for your expenditure. And, and that's um, a lot of the insight we got in terms of that that allows us to assess quite quite quickly to what extent uh, your um, expenditure is driven by what we call emerging drivers, which is um, driven by electrification and the need to uh, provide for EVs um, and others um, is has be, has been helpful in shaping our view, and um, and I know there's been we've already received some feedback. Um, so I just see that Dale has has got her hand up. Uh, please, if I hand to you, Dale. Um, Orion's got a, quite a long um, history of forecasting for resilience um, as a traditional um, expenditure item. Uh, I wondered why the Commission considers that resilience is an emerging driver. Um, I think in the current environment, it's potentially that the risk is increasing um, rather than that it is an emergency, an emerging driver. Um, so I just wondered on your wondered what your um, commentary was around that particular question. Yeah, that, that's a really that's a really good point, Dale. And we understand that a lot of EDBs do have um, you know have have been taking this into account, and probably all of them have been taken resilience into account to some extent or another over the years. Um, and we do appreciate any any thoughts you have on um, how how we've categorized these quite you know like into two groupings. It was very dichotomous in or out. Um, the reason why resiliency in our in this slide deck, and this is by no means set in stone, um, is included in an in emerging view, is that we saw such a great diversity in in EDBs having um, um, you know citing it as a primary driver. And and so if climate change is affecting, for example, is affecting New Zealand overall and more extreme weather seems to be and and other reasons for why networks need to be resilient seems to be um you know featuring quite heavily in in the likes of you know orion in their plants and there's like you know more than 10 percent 15 percent um attributed as a primary driver and but for a number of edbs it's not it's not the primary driver at all and hence we, we put it into that bucket to see because it doesn't seem to be driving a lot of money at this point, but it may, but in our view, it, it likely will um, drive more money in future, but it just isn't according to the, the information received from you. So I think that's a very simple thing for this, um, for this um, reset is to just make it a, um, um, a, a traditional driver, you know, um, and please explain to us why, why that is, why it is for the likes of Orion um, a, a, a traditional driver, um, but we 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 thought that it it's emerging and that it hasn't it doesn't feature heavily yet for a number of EDBs uh, in their in their plans at, yet. That that was the reason for classifying it. That's not set mm -hmm. in stone. So, yeah, so do let I, us know. I guess one um, initial observation could be that there's different maturity levels across EDBs in terms of thinking about resilience. And yep. obviously, Orion's experienced a pretty significant earthquake. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. And while we thought about it before that, we think about it even more now. Yes. Yeah. No. Absolutely fair point. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so yes. Um, please do um, provide us your detailed feedback on how we've grouped these. Um, so. And, and particularly in light of how we are uh, at, at, at in our emerging view minded to use these this information, we are, we're saying that if you have a higher proportion of emerging drivers um, driving your spend, we think that's indicative that those forecasts are are more are more, are more uncertain. Um, the other thing to note um, is is if we just do some creative maths and ex extrapolate those numbers to um to edbs overall not everybody had to provide this information because we applied materiality thresholds um then of the um 8.5 billion um in capex uh over the uh, dpp4 period that is in 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 the plans 
about 70% is relating to emerging drivers and about 30% or two and a half billion is um, relating to, um, to, you know, what we call emerging drivers. So it's not, the majority is still um, to addressing traditional needs, um, you know, and obviously um, th those numbers are very, there's a lot of extra, extrapolation, but it, it seems as though the traditional reasons far outweigh the, on overall still the um the the emerging driver reasons but that varies significantly by adbs um so before i hand over i've got uh, one more question um i just ask you to i'm sorry i can't see from here who it is jonathan. oh jonathan please go ahead hi there um so I guess the, the question that I have is you're sort of splitting this into traditional and emerging drivers, but for most, I'll say for most investment needs, there's normally not just one driver. So is there a risk by trying to be this granular that you're losing you're losing a lot of information and it's becoming very, I'll say, very subjective? Yeah. And that could be a reason for the variation that you're seeing between EDBs? Um Yes, that's um, that. That may well be the case, um, and keen to see whether there's a there's a way uh, get to view your views on whether there's a way around this, um, or a, a a more sophisticated approach. Um, if if it is consistent with the low cost nature of the DPP, um, ideally in a we wouldn't be doing this at, at this kind of aggregate level. Absolutely not. So it's it's used as a as a as a flag as opposed to as a definitive um, view about say you know the, the the level of uncertainty in the um in, in your forecast um our um i did, did try and um you know get more granular insights um from the from the amp review on um on on you know uncertain level of uncertainty in plans and it they, it wasn't possible for them so this is our attempt um and perhaps at the, at the breakout session, um, we talk about that in a bit more detail if, if there are um, views on that. So, but yeah, okay, it's, 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 it's tough. <laughs> Thanks, Jonathan. Yeah. So another question to me is um, I've got another question from uh, from Scott. Mm -hmm. Scott first and and then Feng. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and it's really just a, a comment. It does seem quite a bold assumption that just because it's an emerging, emerging view that it is going to be uh, more uncertain. And I guess the consequence of um, making that statement or view is the, the gates or potentially the, um, or the gating of those capex are probably going to be harder on something that's more uncertain. And, and of course, a consequence if there actually is quite certain that investment's needed. Um, for example, if the network's running out of capacity because of, and your, your headroom on that capacity is getting short, well, then mm -hmm. the need to invest is quite certain, and it's still going to be captured in the emer uh, in the emerging drivers. It's just a, uh, it, it, you know, it could result in some probably not particularly favourable gating. I think with that, unless we're really certain around that relationship. Yeah, absolutely agree. Thank you. Bang. Um, I think again, just comments so to add on to Jonathan's point is that done. Um, uh, the split between traditional and emerging could be quite highly sensitive to the assumption that EDB made when they put through the 53ZD um, uh, not, uh, submission. Uh, <clears throat> some of the assumptions that could be that um, if a project was planned under a traditional driver, however, there's a new emerging driver coming in, then that spend might be grouped under the emerging driver rather than the traditional driver, which means that even if there is no traditional driver that span still need to eventuate. So I think it might be important to look at the assumptions that the, um, the EDB is put under under their submission. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Right, at this point, um, I'm going to hand over to Trung and for, in the first place, we'll um, go into the, a bit more into the, the detail. Um, so, over to you, Trang. Thank you. Thanks, Tobias. Um, so in this section, we share our analysis and some potential metrics we've used to identify um, our expenditure to 
to test the reasonableness of a forecast and to identify where further scrutiny is needed. Um, so we'll go through this um, category by category. So the first one is non-network asset and asset relocations. Uh, so these two categories make up a relatively small portion of total capex. So you know, similar to the past. So in the earlier slide, um, these categories made up about nine percent of total forecast capex for DPP4. Um, the graphs here show the average annual forecast spend for non-network assets and asset relocations by EDB, and compares forecasts for DPP4 with actual spend over the past five years. It shows there are variability, there is variability across the EDBs, but the scale of spend is, you know, is mainly minor, although there are some exceptions. So we've not identified any simple consistent metrics that we could use to assess the reasonableness of forecast expenditure for these categories. Um, we note that forecast expenditure may be warranted, so you may be exceeding for really good reasons, you know, it could be for IT upgrades or where a third party has provided the asset to the EDB. Um, so our emerging view is to scrutinise expenditure that is inconsistent with past levels so that we can understand the rationale for that investment. Um, we think that's consistent with a relatively low cost regime um, and we're proposing to limit the scrutiny to information contained in EDB apps. Or alternatively, we could seek driver information consistent with the 53ZD information request issued in November last year. So for DPP4, uh, we're intending to continue continue to consider asset replacement and renewal and resilience and safety and environment capex categories together as renewal based capex. So the REC and asset replacement and renewal expenditure can be interchangeable to an extent, especially given that asset replacement and renewal expenditure often supports REC purposes. Um, we note that different distributors have different practices around how they allocate expenditure between these two categories. So consider, considering them together for the purposes of setting the allowance continues to make sense. Um, the graph here compares forecast renewal related capex with expenditure over the past five years in terms of average annual spend and the difference between actual and forecasts in expenditure terms. It shows that the majority of EDBs are forecasting to spend up to 150% more than they have in the recent past. So based on the information provided in the section 53ZD, we can see that traditional drivers, asset health, age, safety and reliability, remain the main drivers for renewal related expenditure, expenditure for DPP4. Although emerging drivers like resilience may not have been a primary driver for investment, but it is likely to have been consideration when, when deciding which assets to renew or replace. We know that not all EDBs were required to provide driver information for renewal related capex when responding to the notice. So we're interested in hearing from you if your experience is different from what our analysis telling, is telling us about that mix. Um, in terms of what simple metrics, screening metrics, could we apply um, or approaches for assessing expenditure? We've identified three. So the first one is, you know, theoretically, we could develop our own replacement expenditure model and use that to assess EDB forecasts. Our early view is that although this would be great to have, it's not practical for DPP4, and it's something that we could explore for future resets. Alternatively, we could use a simple depreciation-based metric, such as a comparator for renewal-related, as a, as a comparator for renewal-related spend. I mean, over time, expenditure depreciation should be a good comparator for renewal-related spend. The challenge for DPP4, though, is whether the five-year DPP period is long enough to average out the peaks given the level of change and uncertainty facing the energy sector. The two potential depreciation metrics we've identified are so depreciation as a percentage of remaining asset life or depreciated asset value. We could do that by using the ID Schedule 4, um, where, which has the RAB values in it and forecasted values in the EDB amps to calculate remaining life. Another option, and one that you're sure that you're familiar with, which we've used in the past, is to compare forecast renewal expenditure against implied depreciation. So this would consist of calculating depreciation based on forecast renewal spend and comparing it with forecast spend in your AMPs to see if it's consistent. We, we know that this is simplistic as a metric on its own and is unlikely to reflect timing differences due to network condition and other factors that influence decisions to invest earlier. One way to acknowledge this is to set a threshold that is higher than the calculated value to capture some of this variability. Uh, 
Um, so we know there's many good reasons for why it is in the long-term interests of consumers for EDBs to spend more than what these simple metrics would indicate. The approach of having simple screening metrics would provide the flexibility to consider this in a low cost, relatively low cost way. So in addition to using EDB amps, we could, so if, if, a, if an EDB um, meets the threshold for additional scrutiny, um, we could use uh, EDB amps um, to, to dig a little bit deeper. So we could review the asset condition information, particularly classes H1 and, and H2. Or alternatively, we could request additional information similar to what was provided in the Section 53ZD notice to review. We're also mindful when we, th when we think about how we approach the settings for um, re renewal-related capex. There are limited opportunities for EDBs to utilise reopeners for renewal-related capex. Um, and we'll need to think about how that sort of is considered and played out when thinking about this category. Um, I'm going to pass on to Peter, who will take you through our emerging thinking on load-related capex. Kia ora koutou. Uh, my name is Peter Hunter. I'm an analyst in the EDB team here at the Commission. Uh, so we, for the next section on load-related capex, which is that which we uh, use to accommodate uh, changes in either the level or pattern of electricity supply and demand, uh, which is both uh, consumer connections and system growth capex. During DPP3, we assessed these together and used a single simple metric to uh, assess need. With system growth seeing a large increase as a total proportion of spend and an even larger increase in dollars over the uh, upcoming period while consumer connections is relatively stable, we think that it's probably uh, appropriate to no longer treat these as one singular category. Um, as we can see here on this, this slide, uh, it is no longer the case that those EDBs expecting to have large increases in consumer connections expenditure are also those expecting to have a large amount of system growth. Um, there is system growth across the board uh, with many EDBs ex um, expecting that they would be spending over double historic levels where consumer connections remain relatively stable uh, and only a few EDBs signifying that there is a significant step change in expenditure. Uh, so as this is just the same idea again, uh, those EDBs on the left in the consumer connections grow, uh, are staying relatively stable uh, with some exceptions. Those high growth EDBs remain high growth. Those low growth EDBs are also remaining low, relatively low compared to the rest of the EDB. However, this doesn't hold for system growth. We are expecting that some EDBs are forecasting very large increases in maximum coincident peak demand, while uh, many of the others are remaining stable. So what does that mean for our emerging views on setting load-related um, capex? Uh, our emerging view is that we have to treat these separately. Um, as we can see from the first two slides, treating them as a single um, bucket is no longer likely appropriate. It also means that we are likely to need multiple metrics to assess these categories of spend. And that finally, that all of our assessment will be done before capital contributions are taken into account as we're trying to assess need and not how it's going to be funding. That will come as a separate step of our expenditure um, assessment and allowance setting, but is not discussed further in this workshop. So we'll start with the relatively stable one in consumer connection capex. So here we just represent consumer connection capex as a proportion of 2019 to 2023 actual capex on average. So on average, it's about 30% higher than historic levels with three EDBs expected to spend significantly above that. Um, these large gaps from 
historic spend would likely indicate that there is a um, larger chance of a windfall gain if actual and forecast capex differ materially and once again ex outside of capital contributions so in the past we've used growth and new connections as a metric uh, for assessing new connection growth and while it remains our best metric as we can see from the graph on the right that it's not particularly informative uh, while there is a slight um, upward positive relationship it's with we are not seeing that all of this spend is driven by growth uh, there are definitely some edbs that are expecting to have relatively low consumer connection growth but still forecasting significant increases in consumer connection capex this would indicate that by itself this metric would not be sufficient to group edbs in a way that we could then assess thresholds So then we come to the investment by driver um, overall for consumer connections that we are seeing that mostly on aggregate uh, these are driven by historic uh, traditional drivers but once again we do have a few EDBs that are indicating a large increase in emerging drivers as a reason for increases in consumer connection capex um, as to be as mentioned that and to these to the questions that we had earlier we are aware that these groupings are not exhaustive and we would likely use this as a and grouping rather than a singular metric to determine who we would assess further um, but we would expect at least at this stage that those edbs with higher levels of emerging drivers for consumer connections these forecasts might be uh, subject to greater uncertainty and therefore warrant some further scrutiny um, the other metric we're looking at here is a potential metric is consumer growth capex per new connection and then comparing that to historical um, i will note there is a slight typo uh, one typo on this page that it's six edbs are forecasting significant which it should be greater than 30% increase in cost per connection rather than the 50% noted there. So here for many EDBs, cost per new connection remains stable. However, there are compared to their historic levels. However, there are a few EDBs as noted where there are large increases in cost new, per new connection, which could potentially uh, indicate a change in scope or a significant change in input costs. Um, we are interested in digging into this a bit further perhaps and as indicated by Tobias we are looking at ways we can assess some of this co increase in cost to assess whether it is something we can factor in in a relatively low cost DPP or if it would require too much um, bespoke analysis. So Moving on to system growth, which as alluded to is forecast to see large increases pretty much across the board by EDBs. This is probably, or this may be because of the increasing drive to decarbonize and electrify our economy, um, but it would indicate that perhaps historic uh, expenditure here while useful for providing a baseline may not be the sole um, metric we can take into account uh, as we see we are expecting a very large increase overall uh, in do dollars per year uh, almost 200 percent increase on historic levels and the majority of edbs are expecting to spend at least 100 percent of their increase in their historic average uh, only four of the EDBs across the country are expecting to be at or below the historic levels. Um, so while there are some very, very large increases here, this by itself is not going to be a sufficient uh, metric to assess 
going forward, but can be useful in aggregate with or alongside other metrics. Um, here we see that unlike the other two categories, the other categories of expenditure where traditional drivers remained relatively a relatively high proportion of the expenditure for system growth, there is a far larger proportion of emerging drivers um, with about 55% overall remaining traditional, but for some EDBs, uh, we have a very large uh, increase in emerging drivers. Uh, and question from Feng. Yeah, so I think just to comment again that which I made pre previously because um, the emerging drivers and traditional drivers. You muted. Are, oh, sorry. Um, I'm muted. All right. Yeah, I'm good. Sorry. OK, no, I think I was just trying to make a point here that uh, the assumptions on how people categorize um, their spend under either emerging or traditional because could be quite sensitive to the numbers you're presenting here. Uh, I think for us um, from Horizon Networks, um, we have a couple of large expenditures which we bundled under under the emerging drivers. However, um, due to um, change in the timing driven by the emerging drivers or change in the capacity, um, however, removing the emerging drivers, we, st we will still need to spend um, uh, these invest investment under the traditional drivers. Um, therefore, if we look realistically, the lar large proportion of our system growth will be actually traditional traditional drivers rather than emerging drivers, which is presented in here. Yeah, um, and we are cognizant of the fact that these are a uh, very broad brush, and we would be looking to use them in um, concert with a bunch of the other metrics that we're looking at here, rather than a single bucket of if you are in a high level of emerging drivers, then you would see further scrutiny. Um, we are trying to assess these in a relatively low cost manner. And this was just a metric that we have come across as a potential for further triggering further scrutiny. So, and we are aware we would seek feedback on how we have grouped these uh, in both discussion and in uh, submissions. Uh, so we did get in cross submissions that we consider grouping EDBs uh, to assist with assessments of uh, expenditure into some, something like high, medium, or low growth. Um, as we saw with consumer growth capex and for system growth, these uh, groupings don't appear easily on a uh, graph, a uh, simple plot. Uh, as we've discussed with consumer connections, we still see that there are some EDBs forecasting large increases um, in expenditure, even though they're seeing relatively low um, consumer connections, and which is why we don't no longer consider this is a particularly appropriate um, metric for system growth. And we are proposing to use uh, system growth capex compared to uh, maximum coincident peak demand growth, uh, which is the graph on the right, which still shows that there is a lot of uh, noise in the graph. We do think that this is the best metric we have to assess um, EDB system growth expenditure, but given how much uh, other factors are likely driving this expenditure, it's unlikely to be um, sufficient on its own to assess the reasonableness of CapEx provided to us in apps. Uh, so this is just the data in the plot um, previously, which is just megawatt per hour, uh, megawatt, uh, dollar per megawatt for system into, uh, incremental demand growth. Uh, we do see some very large uh, dollar per megawatt volumes, but we actually consider that this is not appropriate in relative uh, by itself, and that it, the better metric here is comparing this to historic spend by EDB. Um, so here we get a better feel for how this 
is represented across the EDBs. Um, we see that some EDBs are expecting to have large increases in system growth uh, dollar per change in um, maximum coincident peak demand. Uh, but for most EDBs, it's either stable or, in fact, their system growth expenditure is actually less than historic levels. Uh, so this would indicate that perhaps those EDBs with forecasting large increases, we may have to look at further because there may be scope changes or differences in their um, how they're going forward. Um, Thomas? Peter, um, how do we best indicate to you uh, the reasons for these increases um, so we support your analysis? Um, the first slide network increase there that's uh, nicely highlighted by your chart is a result of um, change in treatment expenditure. So that, that there's no change in historic um, expenditure or uh, change to historic expenditure. Um, so, so some of your analysis may highlight um, just these the sort of changes. So the question is, how do we best engage with you? On uh, that? In the first, in the first instance, uh, please yeah. provide rid of submission on this uh, workshop uh, and discussion when we get to that point uh, further on in the session. Uh, and then I believe the best place going forward is to continue to highlight these changes in the AMPs, which are our first go-to call or call for this style of assessment. But please submit a, a written submission here will be very useful on why you might consider this may highlight, uh, give us incorrect or potentially infer incorrect inferences from what we're seeing in the metric. Yeah. And I guess uh, since these numbers were taken from the 53ZE notice, it may not yeah. have been supported as well um, by commentary, right? Yes. No. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, there's another question. Sorry, I can't see who from. Hi, Peter Nathan from Powerco. Um, an observation we've had is that if an EDP has a significant increase in their demand forecast, that would result in the metric, the dollar per change in maximum demand, um, potentially sort of being lower or decreasing. Would you agree with that? So it's, you need to, what I'm saying is you need to scrutinize the spend as well as the demand forecast. Yes, um, these are both parts of going forward it, and this would be a, good indicator for us to dig in deeper right this is just a first board of call on do we need to assess further and for that reason that you pointed out that there might be a big change in the growth uh, forecast and the demand forecast that may be driving the spend but we wouldn't be able to see that at a high level we'd have to go in on an EDB by EDB basis yeah, sure it's another question there uh, Jonathan Uh, oh, thank you. So the, the question I had is sort of how are you taking into account what is effective, what can be a very lumpy um, nature of providing system growth capex, um, you know, particularly if you're needing to spend on a substation or, you know, a major upgrade in order to provide the next, you know, 1, 10, 15 megawatts. But during, I'll say during every other year, you haven't had to spend that. So it, it jumps quite a lot between high and low, depending on what you need to provide for um, for that um, CapEx. Uh, so this is probably going to feed quite nicely into the discussion on reference periods later on, uh, where we <laughs> realise that, you know, historic spend is not a perfect indicator, but it does help try and provide a baseline for us going forward. Um, and it captures quite nicely in some ways the differences between EBs that we would otherwise struggle to accommodate in a simple dollar in dollar metrics. Um, so yes, we accept that there might be some lumpiness in some of these forecasts and com when comparing to historic data. Um, and we look forward to your discussion, uh, any further discussion on uh, what appropriate 
reference periods might be to try and help accommodate for some of this lumpiness. OK, thank you. Uh, back to Feng, I think. Yeah, just adding to Jonathan's comment, I think apart from the reference period, the type of spend needs to be considered as well, because if you are spending money on the LV network, versus spending money in the substation, you want to make sure that the money is being substation could um, count to takes into account 30 plus years or 40, 50 plus years of of the asset life and make sure that demand um, and growth will be will be captured under that capacity as well. So I think there's another point of consideration because it's not quite Apple Apple when you're talking about substation upstream upgrade versus LV upgrade. They are both by driven by system growth, but they're different level yeah. of intensity and and, um, and capacity level. Yeah, and I would refer to the point that this is our just a starting point um, to try and identify which EDBs we do need to spend some more time on looking at at a potentially more granular level because we are in a relatively low cost DPP. Um, we can't go into the project level for all EDBs. It's just not feasible under a low cost DPP. But if we can get some reasonably good metrics to identify where we need to scrutinize further, we can increase the chance that we can accommodate more EDBs under a DPP style regime. Uh, Thomas? Um, this is a slightly more uh, general question, um, but um, we, we generally talk in here about uh, emerging technologies and uh, system growth because of electrification. And um, most, I would imagine most uh, M forecasts from EDBs um, may still be using the current technology. And for example, with um, upgrading our networks, um, and some of you may have um, listened to a podcast on Volts recently, they were talking about composite uh, reinforced uh, conductors, which will potentially significantly change amps for all the networks. Uh, where you, you may spend more conductors less on uh, towers. Um, because of SEGIN, it improves uh, the capacity of networks at actually lower cost. Um, is this something that um, potentially the Commission, together with Electricity Authority, is going to be looking at and introducing maybe some efficiency standards which will completely change this whole area? It's probably a topic for <laughs> some other time, but is this something that that is talked about as, as, as part of these capital forecasts for ADVs? Um, because if efficiency standards were introduced for conductors, it will it will massively change amps for all of us. Um, yeah, I'd have to get back to you on that one. I'm not sure what our approach is there, um, but okay. I think there is definitely some future considerations going on in how that would be assessed. Thanks. Uh, Frank, do you have a comment to add? I do. Uh, I did have one question. I was just thinking uh, in terms of your submissions that you provide, noting that um, in this process, we're trying really hard to understand there's a lot of complexity in the forecast and lots of underlying drivers, and we're trying to really get you know, information to assess that. So one of the things that would be really useful for us in our process is if you're able to say in your submission, you know, what is the best way for EDBs to provide information to support our understanding of the variances in and remember, it's got to be in a relatively low cost way for both the Commission and yourselves. Um, and you know, and if you look at sort of recent examples, we've had the Section 53ZD notice where we had a, um, you know, a table format where we asked for primary drivers. It's not perfect, um, but that was, you know, one example of, of how we can collect in, information to assess the underlying drivers. So again, really interested to know from you what other options might exist out there that we should consider. OK, um, so moving on, um, as we have had representations over the period, the, both the 2023 IM review and as part of the DPP4 process, um, there is some concern about overspend of CapEx for a traditional poles and wires style um, network when there are these emer potential for emerging drivers 
and emerging OPEX spend that can help defer or remove the need for some of this CapEx spend. Um, so here we just provide a representation of CapEx expenditure as a proportion of total expenditure um, compared, and then this is then compared to historic expenditure on in the same way. Um, so we see here that there are many EDBs forecasting to uh, significantly increase their capital intensity as a that might be um, just due to where they are in a renewal cycle or the need for excess uh, system growth expenditure. But it is something we are cognizant of, um, even though the current representations have been that while there are emerging levels of um, ability to defer or CapEx with OPEX expenditure, these um, opportunities still remain relatively small. Um, we would be interested to hear if you had any ways that we could uh, incorporate this further. Um, but at this stage, we don't think we can do much at a DPP level when setting the um, expenditure because the assessment this we would have to do in the context of a DPP is too uh, bespoke or intent, uh, resource intense. Um, and here we just provide some submission questions. I will pass now on to uh, Simon, I believe, to discuss the application of some additional tests and reference periods. Thanks, Peter. Um, been a very helpful session and really appreciate everyone's engagement so far. There is going to be a um, breakout discussion in uh, a couple of minutes to um, you know, allow things to sort of have a further opportunity to speak. But uh, sort of any questions or concerns which people have around sort of the pace at which we're going at, please drop them in the chat. We'll try and be mindful of those as we continue moving on. Uh, So I may just have to have my colleague drive my slides for me. We can move to the, the next one, please. That's great. Thanks very much. Um, so the session so far has really been quite focused on metrics and potential metrics which we could apply. And uh, there's been quite a bit of talk about that traditional versus emerging driver. And I think it's worthwhile noting that um, it is intended to kind of identify for us the potential relevance of metrics and, and it's not necessarily definitive characteristics of themselves. Um, but beyond metrics, there are sort of additional things which we could do. Um, and again, we've noted being mindful of a relatively low cost regime. Um, we've tried to outline on the role of additional, in particular, additional engineering reviews could be. And a lot of that is really informed by the findings of the process from the um, IAE's review of the 2023 asset management plans and some of the challenges which comes about from doing that. Um, so we think that there are certainly some circumstances where this could apply. There is likely to be, um, you know, good reasons why metric analysis might, might not sort of uh, fully represent an EDB situation. Um, but in the context of a relatively low cost regime, we have to think about where the additional review is likely to provide value. So what we've outlined here is sort of some characteristics um, or thought about the characteristics of expenditure, which is likely above thresholds, which may be better suited for additional reviews. So that's going to take account of things which have um, discrete drivers. So if an increase in expenditure is primarily or clearly identifiable to a primary driver, rather than multiple drivers, then it might be better suited to additional review. Um, and that relates also for the driver of the increase in expenditure has relatively high levels of certainty that it will be required. If we start moving into a project which has relatively low levels of certainty, then as Dale talked about earlier, that might be a project which is more well suited to reopeners. Uh, also, another consideration in terms of thinking about the types of engineering reviews is, uh, is the project or program of expenditure driving the increase able to be reasonably separated from other programs of work or BAU programs of work? So can we clearly identify that expenditure? Um, is the impact on the network likely to be relatively targeted rather than broad? Um, and does it not require a high level of additional supporting information to justify? So yeah, really interested in your feedback, um, given what we've talked about to metrics to date and the potential sort of, you know, 
issues and applications. This is an additional lever which we have, which we are mindful of its potential role. We've tried to outline where we think it would work well, but really interested in your feedback on that. Uh, if we can move to the next slide, please. So Jonathan touched on uh, this one earlier, which was the um, yeah the talk about um, the the relevance of the reference period. So um, one of the things which we do here is when we're comparing sort of expenditure against historic, the length of regulatory period is a really relevant uh, consideration. And so um, we're proposing to continue to use a reference period um, as without a reference period, it'd be really di difficult to understand the relative scale of change. In the absence of a reference period, you'd need to use absolute values, which would not work well for EDB. So I've got really wide variability in terms of the size and nature of network, customer base, and how they respond to drivers. In the past, using past expenditure enables us to reflect these characteristics in a relatively low cost way. So our issues paper noted that given the emerging drivers, the use of past expenditure may be less relevant as a starting point. So the use of a historic reference period does not require that the values are kept at historic levels, and we can consider the changes in underlying demand or cost factors. So our emerging view is that there continues to be relevance in using past expenditure as a starting reference point, um, especially where emerging drivers are more prevalent. Uh, so as Jonathan touched on, what we're really interested in setting a reference period is the inherent balancing the inherent lumpiness of capex investment, which might indicate uh, a longer time series is um, more relevant, especially if you know you only replace significant network assets over a more extended period. This is the relevance of more recent periods. So if we think about some potential options just for consideration here, a three-year period may more appropriately capture more recent market challenges, emerging trends and global events like the global uh, COVID-19 pandemic and global conflicts. A five-year period reflects a reference period, a regulatory period, and more than five years, more than five years, so up to a seven years may capture more than one regulatory cycle and provide a more normalized view of spend given the inherent lumpiness of CapEx profiles. We note that a seven-year reference period was what we used for DPP3. And it may be that um, there are submissions around kind of the relevance of reference period is different for different sized EDBs, where larger EDBs with a large network may, may be more likely to invest in so a shorter reference period may capture that inherent lumpiness in CapEx profiles, whereas for smaller EDBs it actually might be um, a longer reference period may be more relevant. All right, can we move to the next slide, please? So as we noted uh, um, at the start and in the slide deck, We've tried to balance today a mixture of um, submission questions and discussion questions, and we've really appreciated the engagement which we've had so far, um, and that has been fantastic. Thank you for those. We're looking to continue that dis uh, that discussion shortly, um, but because there is a lot of things which we are interested in, we've done a mix between asking for questions with for written submissions, so that's a couple of them here, and a couple which we're going to be discussing as well as getting written submissions. So can we move to the next slide, please? So I think we're actually bang on time, which is great. Um, moving to the discussion group. Now, we had indicated that we were going to be moving into breakout groups. Unfortunately, we've encountered some IT hiccups today, um, and so we won't be splitting people out into individual groups, which means we're going to continue in this wider group session um, and continue sort of uh, having the discussion, which hopefully we've started to date. We, as I noted, we really appreciate your engagement, um, and we're really looking forward to some more soon. Really interested in your views on topics we've covered today and further progress which we could make, further considerations within the framework which we could apply um, and any particular insights you have. So the team is you know, trying to balance today, um, I guess the being able to respond to specific questions. So there might be the instances where there's a question which might be appropriate to respond to. But what we're really interested in is your views. We're interested to really facilitate a discussion so we can take feedback from yourselves and you can kind of bounce ideas around amongst yourselves. So we may be able to answer some questions, but we're probably not looking to specifically respond to questions as much as kind of understand where your key concerns are or understand where you think we could uh, benefit from focusing on. And I think uh, we won't be, we previously indicated we would be taking notes um, on, the, on the basis that we were going to have multiple discussion groups. I don't think that that will no lo any longer be relevant because the entire workshop recording will be available at the conclusion of the workshop. So we won't be using sort of a, a notes functionality and then circulating that at the end. We do have a break also coming up at the end of this session. Um, I, I know it's been a lot so far and we've covered some ground, but uh, really appreciated the attention and input. 
So that, okay. that's a great point from Dane. Uh, so we're going to move on to um, the discussion questions, which I'll get uh, to be to facilitate. Um, but yeah, as Dane said, we'll see how we go. Hopefully the discussion will get us through to about 11.30 um, is, is what we've targeted at the moment, uh, and then have a five minute break. Um, I'll pass over to Tobias. Thank you, Simon. Um, so I think we'll, um, in, in terms of practicalities, I think we'll leave the the slide that we, you you can currently see on, as it as it sets out the questions, the the numbering that we're interested in discussing, but. Please feel free to also, you know, um, cover related points. Um, the slide numbers, I, uh, you, you likely have the um, the slides um, that we published um, nearby or or an electronic format. Um, so the slides numbers are the um, the ones in the pack, not this presentation version. So we've got two slide uh, number references. Um, so just just in, in summary, what we're looking for is um, on these questions or related questions, um, topics, our emerging positions, um, and whether um, from, from what we've explained to you, you understand how we formed that view and, and how we can improve that view. Um, you know, you've already started with this. Um, you've given us some implementation. Um, uh, comments that we, that we can consider and please also provide us alternative options on metrics and on applying these tests. Um, so if I now just um, open the floor um, to to anyone who's um, who, want, who wants to make a start, perhaps we start first talking about uh, metrics and then then applying the tests. Uh, yes, please, uh, Dale. Um, I just wanted to ask a question that's probably slightly off topic, um, but it does go to um, the, the Commission's consideration of thresholds. Um, in terms of reopeners, um, we, we can apply for a one-off project or a programme um, in, a, in the um, determination the programme is defined as a group of related projects with a common purpose. Um, so my question is, um, and using process heat as an example, uh, does the Commission consider um, across a number of businesses, just not just one, whether that could be counted as a programme of work with a common purpose to decarbonise industry? Um, thank you for that, Dale. Um, we have an, another uh, session coming up that, that will cover reopeners and deliverability. So what I'm going to do is defer that the answering that question to that session that we'll have um, after. Um, I think we, we're going to have half an hour, about half an hour discussion, then presentation, and then we'll have another 15, 20 minutes or so of discussion on reopeners. So if okay. I may, I will defer to that session. Yep. No problem. Thank you. Um, Craig. Craig Donaldson. I've got, um, it's got yeah, his hi. hand up. Sorry, it's getting... Hi, um, Hello. Thanks to the Commission for hosting this um, workshop. Um, really good to be able to speak with you and, and put our points across. Um, just in terms of the metrics, I'm just, I mean, you guys have been able to um, identify the where the outliers are. I mean, you've got the box in each of those slides, there were boxes. Is it is it worth or is it a possibility that the commission goes directly to those distributors and and seeks information directly from them from the outlier uh, um, businesses and you know instead of approaching everybody just just going and and I'm I'm not sure whether it will fit in with the low low cost approach but um, you know if you've got three or four that have three or four issues that might be an, a way to go. Yeah, it, it, it's a good comment. So, um, so first of all, we've drawn boxes, um, but these are just kind of 
you know, like literally they're boxes. They're not. We haven't set the threshold at those levels. That's not. Oh, no, you know, no, no, it's, no, no. So, so just just it. to be very clear about that. Yeah, no, 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 no. Um, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that at all. But I'm. I mean, clearly, you know, you, where you can see in the boxes, yes. yeah, there are some differences to the to the to the yeah. the other trends. And I guess so, yeah, there was another one in terms of the reference period. Um. Has the commission considered stripping out outliers that that and, and potentially COVID? Yeah. Um, um, I'm not. I'm not sure what that would come up with, but I know, mean, you know, a lot of us are locked up. Almost all of us are locked up for for about a year. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a there was a lot of a lot of differences that would have come through. What I thought. So. Answering to your first observation about could we go directly to businesses that that are identified some through the tests as mm. as outliers? The answer is we could, but our preference would be not to because of the low cost nature of the the regime. Yep. So if there is another way that is just you know we apply a simple metric and way we go, that would be our preference. In terms of COVID, when we we did look at the data and thought, is there a lot? Um, was there a lot of less activity during the 21 20 21 22 even and dale mentioned earlier as well that maybe some of the increase increases we see now are just a result of deferral mm. when when you look at the numbers it's not clear that activity dropped there may have been a, a number of things that may have happened and maybe people Deliver different things during the period, but that's kind of in a you know that may have cost more, and so we don't see a drop in expenditure. But you know, so so yeah, it's, from, from the expenditure on its own, we we can't we can't see a simple way of of doing that. But if there is a way, that means for the reference period, COVID should be COVID period should be deweighted or excluded, and we very much welcome that um, that insight from from yeah, your, I mean, in your submissions. Well, you you just had it on the heat as well. I mean, potentially expenditure was in another bucket when it would have been in something else. Yeah. Um, if we get crews out there to, to do the work. Yeah. Yeah. That's no, all I had yeah. to say for now. Yes. Thank you. Sure. Sure. Awesome. Um, next, go to Jonathan, please. Um, so I guess this discussion's um about the metrics and I'll say as Horizon has has sort of um, pointed out, there's a bit of um, I'll say a bit of subjectivity around whether something has a traditional or an emerging driver. And I was just wondering if it would be useful to get insights into where is an emerging driver just modifying something that was traditional, for example, changing the capacity or changing the timing of what would have been a traditional investment, and whether it's actually something that is solely driven by these um these emerging i'll say emerging technologies emerging needs that we're um we're expecting to come out through decarbonization etc um that could help give you a better idea of how certain this capex is in terms of need um again implying that the emerging um the emerging drivers are probably probably less certain than the ones that do have an underlying traditional traditional need mm -hmm. That's a very good point, and because I did not actually prepare any of the, of the underlying data, what I'm going to try and do is actually ask if somebody else would like to comment on that, whether that's a possibility of, you know, we, we can do, we can, for example, um, in, a, in a, you know, we, we can ask for further information, and if, if somebody um, else thinks that's a, that's a good idea, um so i'm i'm going to I, I know who's got the hand up right now and i'm trying to look out for anyone who would like to answer that question to put up the hand now or if not i ask you to um, consider that as part of your submission so is anyone out there that would like to comment on jonathan's um suggestion that perhaps the a further information you, you could provide further information about whether, you know, we can further refine the the emerging driver analysis.
Michael, I've seen Michael, Brian and Dale come up in response. Um, Michael, Brian, would you please um, provide your view? Yes, sure. Um, uh, I think uh, I guess my reflection on some of the questions and discussions has been that there is still this variability of interpretation as to what we put in 53 ZDs, let alone maybe even asset management plan kind of expenditure categories. So I think if we can find some simple ways of making sure we are consistent in how some of that information is being provided to the Commission, I think that is is worthy of trying. OK. Thank you. Um, I hand over to Dale. Also on that same question. Um, I'm just thinking that maybe uh, the way in which you define emerging and traditional could there's two possible other lenses. One is, is it driven by changing customer choice? Um, and then the other piece is, um, is it something to do with integrating digital and physical networks? Mm -hmm. Which would be two spaces for emerging. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I'm going to hand over to Mariska, who has also put up her hand. Apologies to those that were ahead in the queue, um, but um, I think it's good to get get a variety of views on that question. Okay, thanks. Um, Mariska from Alpine Energy. Just on kind of emerging and traditional again. So. Given Alpine as an example, a traditional driver will be age of the assets, where for us, we are seeing a significant increase in our pole replacement program, but it's a traditional driver, but we've done more work. So we have to, you know, our pole inspections are going to increase from 600 to 850 a year, as an example. So even though it's a traditional driver, it's still driving a significant increase in cost because of the uplift in the program deliverability that we have to do. So I think when we look at these metrics, it's important to understand you know, the reasoning for the increase in cost and the decisions behind it, not only whether it's a traditional driver or an emerging driver. Thank you, Mariska. Um, Feng. I'll just uh, supplement some of the discussions uh, we had previously around the drivers. It would be good to clarify further on emerging versus traditional so that everybody has the same terminology has have the same definition uh, another idea for metrics is that uh, we could have a high level ballpark on with and without that if the emerging um, driver does not eventuate what is the spend profile is going to look like okay thank you um I'm just going to. I think Keith uh, uh, from from the ENA has put up his hand, also as part of the discussion. So I'm just going to hand to Keith next, and then we're going to Ken and and Scott. Keith, um, please. Uh, my comments were back to, to the original slide, so we can just go on to if there's okay. more on the allocation okay. issues. So so uh, so so one one thing we we're, we're going to I think um, on this because this has um, the, the use of the 50 percent of information has has obviously um, got got a lot of interest, and so just to let you know, um, Keith, we will we will likely be in touch uh, with the ANA about that one to see how we can get a, a common view on perhaps um, you know get a more standardized approach to um, interpretation of the 50 to 30 notices. So that's that's likely something we may uh, may approach. I'm just giving you a headlight on that, uh, a heads up on that. Um, thanks, that's that's been really good. Um, I'm going to hand, hand, hand over to Ken next, please. So we can't, we can't hear you. I think you may be on mute. Oh, sorry, I had my uh, that Thank you again. stuck out of the way. Um, Kim Brown from Horizon Energy. Um, just a couple of points around um, the metrics and later on, and that is that is in terms of two things, in terms of one, the scale and the size of the EDB um, can have a mathematical impact on proportionate change. So if a small EDB sort of spends $3 million extra on a substation, 
that becomes a percentage, whereas a very large EDB can spend that same $3 million on a substation and, and has a, a lower impact. So um, how, you, how you interpret that in your metrics could be interesting. The other thing is around the CPI inflation, and I'm not au fait so much with a PPI lift, but definitely in the year 22 and the year 23, um, we had sort of CPI at 7.3% peak at one stage, um, and the year later, somewhere in the sixes. Um, uh, so that presumably I, I, CPI is more a consumer inflation figure. Um, but PPI must have the, uh, and what's going on in the world of, of getting delivery of, of stuff across news, across from the other side of the world to here. Um, I'm just wondering in terms of where all, wherever your um, numbers are calculated, if they're in constant, when you do a reference period of three or four years back, um, that's right through, and even if you did it for seven years, that's a period where up until 22, we had a consistent, 2% kind of OCR target, um, which which the Reserve Bank managed to keep to. Um, the last couple of years, 22, 23, it's gone beyond that. So I just kind of wonder, um, part of the increase in forecast for anybody um, for the AMP23 and then AMP24 or even the 53ZD may still use constant dollars, but the constant dollars will be in today's constant dollars rather than in two years ago's constant dollars. Um, yeah. So there's a bit of an impact of of that that could possibly be uh, a, a way to defuse it or or try and go back to a to convert them to I don't know 2017 2018 2019 um, dollar values um, and which would involve sort of down tuning or whatever just to just to actually say how much of the increase is just a numerics due to inflation. Yeah. Um, so if I for a very brief comment on the the first the inflation and then and then the um, small EDB being more affected by large increases. So the the fact that some of the increases that we're seeing may may be cost increases. That's yeah, that we've had quite a bit of feedback on that. Yeah. And when we when we do calculate the reference period, we need to be very mindful of that. I think there's a there's a chart at the very end that we're still trying to understand a bit better. Of your presentations, um, which which shows that, uh, so so traditionally we've used the capital goods price index as a, as an escalator, and we see in the when we when we drill down into the detail um, of the of the index that um, the EDB specific indicator is sort of outpacing other other EDB. So so we we are in touch with the uh, um, stats and Z about whether they can provide more information on that. So that that's that's a very good point and we're we're, we're mindful of it because uh, we do need to um, compare apples with apples when we make these um, assessments in constant price dollars. Um, in the um, regarding the smaller EDBs, CapEx being much lumpier than than a larger EDBs when they make significant investments. Um, that's something we'd like to hear from you from. Um, um, so calling all small, small ADBs, um, whether that's something that we can have an indicator for. So when we when we look at um, the historical expenditure, um, we do we do notice that you know in terms of just sim simple measures of standard deviations, um, it, it, that is true that EDB smaller ADBs tend to have larger variability, and so. Is, is there a place for that in the CapEx framework to take that um, into account? It's the question for you. So we're keen to hear from you in submissions. Oh, thank, thank you. you for your contributions, Ken. Thank you. Um, Scott, Scott is next. Thank you. Uh, just a, a quick comment around the emerging drivers um, and just be careful that it doesn't become a bit of a red herring because of course, I think we've talked about it, but demand is an aggregate of a whole bunch of things and I don't think it's going to be one thing. Um, but what's important is the relativity to how much capacity headroom that network has, because um, if there isn't a lot of capacity, and like us, we haven't had a lot of growth the last wee while, um, any sort of growth uh, is probably going to drive a step change in, a, in, in expenditure, and that is certain. 
you know what I mean? It's um, it actually isn't an uncertainty question. It's just a um, it's a matter of a, a matter of when we need that investment, and, and the sensitivity around that growth can mean that's nearly certain that's going to be soon, as opposed to later. So I wouldn't get too much too caught up on the emerging emerging drivers. I think it's can be a bit distracting. I think the asset management plans also provide a really good assessment of what that capacity headroom is. The the traditional demand versed um, capacity analysis that we are required to provide um, already provides a, a whole bunch of really good evidence around that for every network. Is that is that um, information that you uh, that is included in, in Schedule Twelve of the asset management plan? Is that what you're referring to, or is there something no, specific, so be, some some specific analysis you can provide? Yeah, that's right. So an asset management plan will provide um, for each of our high voltage networks what's the capacity, what's our forecast demand, when that that each of those networks becomes constrained. Um, so it does provide a uh, some backup information, I guess, or supporting information on on those capital expenditure, on that capital expenditure, a little like an asset health assessment. So so is that is that the information at a at a feeder level that that you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, feeder zone sub sub transmission. Yeah. Yep, that's right. Yep. Is that is there a so this is this is a question for for everyone, including yourselves. Is there a um, a more simple measure that's that's that doesn't require you know detailed modeling of of each EDB's feeder that that could be used as an indicator? Um, so you know looking at network utilization i think that's not the answer but um if you look at that aggregate network utilization you know all the all the variability at the uh, at the that that actually exists across feeder is sort of lost so we I looked at that was, with, yeah yeah and i guess where i was thinking is you've got some which i don't think are terrible i think they're quite good you've got some high level indicators of where you might need extra scrutiny um, I guess where I was going is that extra scrutiny you've already probably been provided in the asset management plans. Yeah, so very very keen to hear specifically from you, you know, what that analysis might look like. So yeah, very keen to hear from you on that. Cool. Yep. Thank you. Although just pointing out again, that analysis is what drives a, a network's capital program and that okay, a forecast and aggregate of all these different emerging drivers plus traditional drivers um, is indicating our network is going to need extra capacity in X years, and that's generally how those plans put together. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, maybe what you're asking is how that could be summarised, although that's in the asset management plans too already. Yeah, and uh, I mean, imagine, imagine as a, for, for us, the detailed schedule, the analysis in Schedule 12, that, that is, there's a lot of detail and there's a lot of variation. So we have to take that for 16 EDBs and and analyze it. That That's simply the question. And the question is, is that, is that the only way you see this possible? Or is there is there a simpler way of doing that? That's what we're really looking forward to. Yeah, and, I, and I, with 16 EDBs, if you've got your, well, you've already indicated there's probably more like four or five where you've got an area you'd like to see more scrutiny, that in itself has given a bit of a haircut down to what that extra scrutiny might be. Um, yeah. I guess all I'm saying there is um, we can provide you extra information, but a lot of that's already provided in the asset management plans already as well. And it's a pretty, um, those methods are pretty well trodden, I guess. Yeah. Thank you. Much appreciated. Heath. So just a, a couple of comments on uh, thresholds um, and metrics on, on these pieces. I think uh, particularly in the customer connections and system growth space, I think there's probably a need to, to tie that into um, looking at both the scale and quantum of connection growth um, and system growth. I notice a lot of those high percentage rates on the charts are ones with very minimal growth. I think, you know, you've got Nelson growing from 0.1 million to 0.1 million um, and up there over 200%. So really need to ca think carefully about how the thresholds work in that space in terms of if a business is just moving um, slightly like Nelson or um, Invercargill or someone like that, uh, making sure there is a reasonableness check so you don't go chasing spending resources to chase down a 100% increase in a $100,000 spend 
um, in that case. So making sure that there is metrics across both the, the scale, the percentage change in, and the, the scale of the total expend. And how does that tie in with the, for example, the IM thresholds for unforeseen and foreseen CapEx reopeners? Obviously, if there's um, a CapEx threshold reopener of $2 million, um, if you're looking at someone like, again, Nelson, it would have to be a you know 400,000 percent increase to to meet that threshold. Um, so where this it's worth having the extra scrutiny based on a percentage or a hard cap on the percentage, whereas the the quantum of the growth is important there. Um, and it's another sort of terms of um, thresholds on the repex stuff. Um, obviously, we've seen um, assets. Um, that have written down over the life of the assets. So you do see things like poles, if they were installed in the 60s and 70s, they've probably fully written off now um, and replacing those poles with a modern equivalent. Um, you're not just going to see a, a, a step up in the, the, I guess the quantum, but also the price, you're seeing a, a real step change. It, with the depreciation allowance was on, you know, the original asset value you know, on the ODV. You see a, a big jump up with the modern equivalents on those. So, so you know, be careful there. So another uh, quant suggestion is perhaps using quantum of work. Um, Riska mentioned that they're really increasing their poll inspections, for example. Um, others may not see that a big rise in quantity of works. So I guess probably goes to deliverables here. Um, mm -hmm. Not seeing the rise in quantity of work, but really a step up in the price. Um, of delivering things. I know the, the ADR reports for um, Aurora and PowerCo really show in terms of when they're doing the quantity reporting on um, many of those sort of things like poles, cross arms, I think um, connectors, there's a real, real step up in price more so than quantity that's driving some of those increases in, um, in the expand. And that may not be captured in the constant price if you're using a, a standard PPI or a CPI. So, so any anything agree um, with the you know the, the make sure that the the threshold is thre thresholds are not not applied in um, you know without actually looking at the you know the 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 the, um, the underlying numbers completely agree in terms of the repex um, so what what we look for here is if you have like specific suggestions how we could incorporate um, the quantum of of works um, what kind of analysis what that might look like um, again might might involve some modeling of what's in schedule 12 of the amp uh, please please do provide um, suggestions um, in your submissions on that um, or or if anybody wants to comment on that on how how we could could improve our um, our um, whether we could have there's a there's a you know simple way of assessing um, renewals um, type work. Um, but welcome to um, contribute now. Um, is there a, a simple way um, of um, that we that we've missed on on improving our um, renewals modeling or renewals assessment? Um, either um, keen on any contribution now, or or if not, please in your submissions. Nobody's. Um, Putting the hand up now. Um, so we've oh got one hand. Reno, um, please. I, I had to guess. I was just reflecting on quite a few things there. Firstly, your use of the word simple. I I don't think any of this is actually simple. So, <laughs> so so in a way, we're kidding ourselves if we think we can find simple measures to 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 address this. So so, so I suppose the question has to become: To what extent are we prepared to take compromises? In, because it is a, a relatively low low cost uh, regime, um, and I'm also still reflecting back on on a few questions back. But part of the problem that I see is is perhaps that that um, in in the amps we we do our forecast to the best of our ability, and 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 we we make judgments about what we're going to spend, um, but we possibly don't look back um, sufficiently at at what we've been spending. And and in the Aurora case, in the Palco case, of course, we've had to present the annual delivery report which was a fairly detailed look at what what we actually did and i think that that will become increasingly important if the commission really wants to understand um going forward 
what what is possible what is the, what is the rate for re replacing poles for example which could then help assessing all, all these uncertainties that you're talking about so so the idea of, of an annual delivery report and, and maybe in a simplified way is, is probably something i would suggest um, uh, and it, i think it's a good discipline for companies in any case if i can put an unpopular statement out there thank you that's um that's much appreciated thank you um dale Um, I just wanted to agree with Reino there. I think um, moving forward, it probably does make sense to have some sort of annual delivery report, but I think because it's a DPP, it needs to be more targeted. Um, and so maybe some of those subcategories that are, you know, significant parts of our spend, such as asset replacement and renewals, um, and possibly system growth could be um, the, the target kind of areas, rather than asking for a report on everything. Thank you. Russell. Russell Shaw. Hi, Russell Shaw from Top Energy. I, I just had a couple of comments around the historical reference periods and uh, just to point out that they are not necessarily a good reflection of what the future is going to be. Uh, for us, we've been through three distinct stages. Uh, firstly, looking at creating security of supply on the network uh, and when you look at our expenditure profiles and the analysis you've done, you can see that we've been three, through three distinct phases and we're now looking at the renewal phase. Uh, so our renewal expenditure has gone up considerably, but actually the other expenditure has nearly all dropped. So I would encourage you when you do look back over historical reference periods and recognise that you do need to have some data to anchor to, uh, that you might also look at the balance across total expenditure. Because sometimes we spend on in one area, we complete a programme of work within a, a regulatory period and then we move on to the next. That's very helpful, thank you. Um, we have one more minute and then we have a um, really five minute break. Um, is there any final question? And really appreciate the engagement um, we've had with you so far. Or would you just like to go and make a cup of tea or coffee if you're in Wellington? Thank you. Um, we will be back in five minutes. Um, and at which point we'll be talking about um, Other factors that apply to DPP CapEx framework, including managing uncertainty, we'll be talking about reopeners and we'll also be talking about deliverability. Thank you. We'll see you in five minutes. All right. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, as to be said, hopefully you managed to get a tea or a coffee or something stronger for Monday morning. Um, we really do appreciate your engagement so far in the workshop. It's been fantastic to have all the comments, and that's really what we're really looking forward to continuing to have. Um, we're now moving on to session three, which is the other factors which apply to a DPP4 CapEx framework, including managing uncertainty and considering deliverability risk. Uh, the focus of this session is going to be on consideration of flexibility mechanisms within the DPP framework and discussion relating to EDB's ability to deliver significantly elevated work programs to the extent that is the underlying drivers, which we refer to here as deliverability. So we're going to have two presenters for this session. We'll have Sapna, who's going to recap uh, the reopener provisions available, large connection contracts, and which were a focus of the IM review. And then Fungi is going to talk through um, some framing around deliverability and how we might consider that within a CapEx framework and the potential for additional reporting requirements, which helpfully was mentioned at the back end of the last session. So a good time. Thanks very much. Um, we move to the next slide. Um, So similar to the, this is the CapEx framework, which we took, talked earlier on. So this is kind of where we are located within the CapEx framework. So I'll pass over now to Sapna to run the session. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sapna and um, I'm Chief Advisor in the Electricity Distribution Team um, at ComCom. So I most, most recently came off uh, the IM review where I worked on the CPP and reopeners work stream. So I'll start with flex mechanisms. 
So flex mechanisms are available to be used if revenue limits need to be reconsidered during the reg period, um, either because of one of two things, so ch changed circumstances during the period, or allowances that we have set excluded spend that was uncertain. Uh, it was insufficiently just justified or identified as requiring a relatively higher level of scrutiny. So we're still doing some thinking about how these mechanisms might be practically applied in setting CapEx allowances. Part of the challenge for us um, in deciding how flex mechanisms can be applied is whether we can identify expenditure that is uncertain from looking at the AMP. So what would be really helpful for us is if in AMP 2024 or other supporting information, if we could, if EDBs could clearly identify and document any assumptions that EDBs have made on expenditure that is uncertain, it would be good for us to understand which projects, programs, expenditure have a level of uncertainty, and what you what you may have included or excluded from the AMP. So flex mechanisms were a key focus of the 2023 IM review. We made a few changes to the suite of mechanisms available uh, where justified in recognition of the changing environment and emerging uncertainty. Given the extent of the changes that were made and particularly that these changes were very recent, our emerging view is not to make further refinements to the flex mechanisms. So work during this reset process as previously um, touched on is to think about how these might apply when we set CapEx allowances. As a result of the IM review, we introduced the Large Connection Contract Mechanism, or LCC, which I'll talk to shortly. We introduced a new reopener and expanded the scope of some existing reopeners. There's the, you know, one stuff. Good, okay. We considered um, other non-reopener mechanisms, which you, you'll see summarized in the table, but we did not introduce any. So across all of these other non-reopener mechanisms that were considered, the key reason reasons for us not introducing was the cost and complexity to implement weighed against the potential benefits and also inconsistency with the nature of a DPP. So on this next slide here, um, these are the reopeners that are now available to EDBs, which we have mapped against CapEx expenditure categories. So just to highlight a few things, the risk event reopener is new. The scope of the unforeseeable and foreseeable large project reopeners has been extended to include OPEX solutions, consequential OPEX, and resilience-related expenditure. We also made changes to the reopener materiality thresholds, the net effects of which have made reopeners actually more accessible. On this slide, we have uh, drawn out a few points that we thought would be worth highlighting for any EDBs that are considering reopener applications. So when EDBs come in for a reopener application, the starting assumption that we would make is that the justification information for the spend is better than what may have been previously supplied, either because better information has become available or new information has become available. There are many considerations when assessing uh, reopener applications. We've highlighted some of the key ones here, which include checking that the expenditure being applied for hasn't already been provided uh, through DPP allowances, that EDBs can show that they've attempted to reprior reprioritize expenditure, and whether the circumstances are such that a CPP might be more appropriate. Something that EDBs may not be aware of necessarily, um, given reopeners have hardly been used to date, is how foreseeability is interpreted for the unforeseeable and foreseeable large project reopeners. So just want to emphasize that this is not to do with the something that not to do with the fact of whether we can see something as coming up or not. It is more to do with whether the expenditure was or was not included in the AMP. And if it wasn't included in the AMP, was it reasonable for it not to have been included? 
We've heard your concerns expressed in subs um, about the speed of processing reopeners and how we might handle volume in future. We understand and agree with the concerns expressed, and we're doing something about this. We are seeing a lot of early engagement from EDBs who are considering reopener applications, um, and this has been really useful for both parties. So just a, an, an appeal from us to please carry on doing this. At this point, given that the slide is to do with reopener application, just wondering whether it's a good point to pause and maybe pick up the question that Dale asked earlier. Dale, would you mind repeating the question for us? Uh, so the question was um, regarding how the Commission would um, treat a program of work. Um, so an example could be for us, we've got a lot of process heat, potential work process heat applications that um, won't meet a reopener because they're, sm they're sm of a smaller size and, and obviously the um, they won't meet the 2.5 million threshold of a reactor. So would, would the Commission um, consider um, a group of projects across different businesses uh, that have the common purpose of decarbonising industry as a programme of work? That's, that's the question. Thanks, Dan. Apologies, could I just ask a clarifying question there, Dale? When you say different businesses, do you mean different connecting parties, not different EDBs? Yeah, I, don't, I, don't I mean different existing customers who may be looking to um, decarbonise their process heat element of their business. Thanks. So, Dale, on that question, um, I think the definition of the IM um, for um, program is a group of related projects with a common purpose. I, I I would like hesitate to give um, specific advice like without knowing the actual facts of the circumstance that you're considering. But my view based on what you've just described is that it's probably a stretch, you know, to apply that to the, the uh, situation that you've just described. Mm, OK. Yeah, but let's it, chat. it does maybe, it does, maybe let's it does chat impact more about it. Yeah, it does impact um around that certainty, uncertainty question with whether an EDB would put something in or out of the AMP. Um but then also the, the size of these particular ones, say for our example, um won't meet a reopener. So then if we take it out, we there's no avenue for addressing them as as they become more certain. Yeah. So, so just on that, I think what I would, um, I mean, my answer to you on whether something should be included or excluded in the AMP is that rather rather than it being a, a yes or a no, uh, I'd say it would be really helpful for us to, um, you know, for 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 you to like document your assumptions on what what you have included and what you haven't included rather than an, an, an in or out um, answer. Mm. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just struggling with, with that comment because if you've um, made a decision whether it's in or out based on assumptions, then it's either we've already made the decision whether it's in the AMP or not. So I think if you just explain that in the app, that would be helpful. Mm. Okay. Um, can I ask another question as well regarding oh, reopening? Right yep. Um, so this question is about timing of applications. Um, so what isn't one hundred percent clear to us is whether you can apply, whether you need to apply for a reopener before you commence the work or whether you can apply during the work or whether you can apply after the work is completed? So I think the wording in the IM is that it, it applies to prospective expenditure. Uh, but in saying that, I understand that, you know, before a business submits a, uh, an application for a reopener that you might have to do some work um, so that you can submit uh, a more informed application. 
Um, and I think in the IMs there is some uh, there is provision for recovery of some of those retrospective costs depending on the situation. But as a whole, um, a reopener should be applied for prospective expenditure. Okay, thank you. And Mariska. Hi. I have um, kind of one broad question and it's a bit of a hypothetical, right? But so if we are kind of certain that we do need to incur certain expenditure, but once our final decision comes out, our allowances doesn't allow for it, but it's signaled in our AMP and it's in our AMP forecasts. Under the current reopener structure, there's then no, there's no ability for us to actually submit a reopener. So we know we need to spend the money, but for whatever reason, our CapEx allowances were capped, as an example. We don't know what the final decision will be. Um, we still have to spend the money, but there's then no avenue for us to go down a reopener path. So is it then better for us to you know, exclude it from our AMP um, if we think we won't get the allowance for it? It's it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation. I think... Um... Yeah, it, it, in terms of the AMP, it would be useful for us as if, if, if you could signal projects that are certain versus less certain. And in the event that they're not included in allowances and you go down the path of a reop reopener application, what we would be looking for is, is there, you know, is there better information? Has it become more certain because... Um, because you've got new information or evidence during the reg period. So there is an avenue provided it's not the same information as what was in the AMP. There has to be some, there has to, there has to have had some movement in the in the type in in either the evidence, it's become more certain because of X. Simon, did you want to jump in? You're on mute. You're on mute. I am too. <laughs> Just jump in and then maybe just for a clarification there, Mariska. Um, so just in terms of if you, yeah, if you had a, something forecasted in your asset management plan and then it wasn't provided for in the DPP allowance, that would still be included. You could still have a foreseeable reopener. So that still fits within that criteria. It's just about whether it's explicitly or implicitly provided for in the AMP. So mm. when we were talking through the CapEx framework, I think this is why we're having like reopeners as such a focus is about thinking about to the extent that we cap, we cap the amount of expenditure less than forecast, it's kind of going to have to figure about that slight complexity, mm -hmm. what that means for um, projects which were included in the forecast and then what, like, do, is that sort of able to be applied for a reopener or not? So the act of capping as part of a um, allowance does not of itself um, preclude a reopener being able to be applied for, um, but we know that there may be circumstances where a reopener mm -hmm. may not be appropriate. It might be more appropriate to come in for a CPP. We outlined some of that in our IM review. Thanks, Simon. That's all right. And I'll just touch on uh, Dale's point before in terms of I think Satin is uh, bang on and that we won't be providing advice. Um, but these things will sit sort of, um, I guess, circumstance by circumstance. You can understand certain projects which would make sense to group. Um, but I think I guess the concern which we have is a grouping based upon an underlying driver might not be such a uh, appropriate thing to base on. So sort of you're grouping based on decarbonisation activities rather than a group of connected projects which had more of a strong connection, you may be able to put in as a programme. But yeah, I think Sapna offered to have a further conversation on that. Passing back to you, Sapna. Okay, is there, I see a hand up. Hi, yeah, Steve Godfrey from Orion here. Just on that um, certainty sort of aspect, is just picking up on the process heat thing for us, that we've got a, a, a significant number of customers that are likely going to be under the five megawatt level. You go out and talk to, so they don't fit that large customer connection sort of thing. You go out and talk to them, they have absolutely no idea what they are going to do yet because, you know, they've got a, a, a at least another 10 years before they actually have to decarbonise under okay. current law and it's potential that law could be pushed out. So they have absolutely no idea what they're going to do. They have no idea about the size of it. They have no idea even yet if they're going to stay on the same site. So it becomes very, very difficult for us to forecast what expenditure we are going to have for them beyond the next, say, two years when there's some certainty for some customers. So 
then when we sort of, so how do we put that into an AMP when there's such enormous uncertainty? And then if we exclude it from the AMP because there is such uncertainty, and by the sounds of it, the Commission, even if we did put it in there and we said it's hugely uncertain, you wouldn't take it into account in our DPP reset. How then can we apply for a reopener for it when, you know, we are, we can't actually do it as a program of works? And again, I would also say, it's, even when it comes to it, how do we apply for a reopener before the works actually commence when we're uncertain what those costs are going to be? So I think there's got to be, you know, look at whether or not we can apply partway through some works when costs are much better known, but also that programme of works there might need a little bit of thinking about the Commission as to what is actually possible there. Because it seems to us that, you know, we're between a rock and a hard place and that neither the DPP will allow it or, or a um, reopener will allow it. Sorry, I just realised I'm on mute. Thanks for the question, Stephen. Like I, we're, we're very, um, we understand the challenge. And so I think my, uh, what I would say is where, where you can indicate it in your AMP, do so. And if not, I think it'll, you know, it'll have to come up mid-period as a reopener application. But it can't come up as a reopener application if it's not counted as a program of works because these guys won't fit the threshold. So that's that's the issue we've got. So I think we sort of need some guidance from the Commission as to what you regard as a program of works, whether sort of decarbonisation particular stream does fit it, and yep. and also about the when do we actually have to apply for a reopener? Can we actually do it part way through the actual works? being undertaken so we've got a better idea on the costs because things do change in these customer discussions all the time. I think we'll have to take that point away, Stephen, and uh, give it some thought as to how we might provide guidance in the future. Right, thank you. Thank you. We got another question. I see two, two more questions. Um, Jonathan was first, I think. Uh, yeah, this this may be a question that's sort of more suited to guidance on reopener, but I was just interested in knowing you you talked about the fact that reopeners apply to prospective expenditure, and in a lot of cases they're gonna they're gonna apply to expenditure where initially the timing of the need and the pace of change was uncertain, and now we have some certainty about that need and that pace of change. And if we put in a reopener application, is it a case that the Commerce Ex Commission would expect us to, what I'll say is sort of down tools and not work on that project until that outcome? Or once the application is in, can we start work um, while at the same time as that um, reopener is being considered? That's actually quite a tough question to answer, Jonathan. Um, I don't think the expectation is for businesses to down tools. Um, I think it's 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 up to a business as, as to when exactly they apply for a reopener. Um, you know, as I said in the IMs, there is some allowance for retrospective costs, but they apply um, only in certain situations. Um, but practically understand that, yeah, you know, it, it's not a case of stop the clock while we wait for a reopener application. Simon, I don't know whether you want to jump in and say anything more about that. No, I think that's that's bang on, Fapna. Um, we wouldn't expect that the business to stop the work. Obviously, the earlier application, the better. And there's a, a, the exposure that the work goes ahead and then the reopener isn't successful for you know any reason. But there isn't an expectation that kind of the reopener will pause. Um, but as we've kind of signaled a few times, the earlier engagement with us on all of this is the better. Um, when you're seeing something which you think might be a good reopener candidate, kind of that that earlier discussion. Um, about sort of what it looks like so we can have so we can make the actual reopen application process as smooth as possible the better thank you thanks Jonathan um, I think we've got another question from Rachel go ahead Rachel Kia ora koutou. Uh, did, uh, Rachel Wellesingham from Unison here one of the um, mission points we've made a few times is about policy 
change and the lack of a reopening mechanism for that. And I think that to a degree speaks to the smaller programs of work that might fit, fit under the reopener thresholds. Um, I suppose one of the assumptions we would be putting in AMPS, for example, would be that there's no, that the forecasting has been on the basis that there's no policy change that dramatically affects the programs of work. Uh, expected over the period. So I'm, I'm curious, I suppose, to hear um, what the Commission's view on that is at the moment when you're looking at certainty. So I think relative to the any reg or policy changes, the reopener that's available um, is the change event reopener. Um, and I'm pretty sure, like we, we said quite definitively in the IM review, that it, it would need to be for a, a a change that has occurred. That's not not that it's likely to occur. I don't know whether that was that was where your question was angling at, Rachel. I suppose um not not really so now what I what I mean is where there's not legislative or regulatory change, but for example, there's an, a government incentive. Uh, that affects industry or um, residential uptake of technology, for example. I don't, um, I'd need to go back and check on this, but I don't think that's currently covered by the change event reopener. Yes, and, and that's, I suppose that's the main point is that that's a, a vulnerability of EDB forecasting and and would, would be clear in assumptions we would put forward. But um, just making the point that there's no solution proposed at the moment, and it doesn't seem to have um, be flagged at this point. I think Rachel just to ju jump in on that one. Um, the other suite of reopeners would apply for the consequential investments which are required to respond to that policy change. So to the extent that there was a change in policy which significantly increased growth in EVs, then you know the. Um, can, whether it's connection capex or system growth capex reopeners would apply under the unforeseeable or foreseeable whatever was relevant so uh, um in general kind of if you're talking sort of get general government policy change the extent it you know creates an underlying driver the reopener suite is available what we don't have is a i guess a more general kind of policy change which might kind of drive different changes in the business or something might be something which you're a little, little bit more concerned about there but if you're talking specific network investments the other clauses does it really matter what the underlying driver is? If it's an underlying driver of policy change, which has increased the requirement of investment on the network, those reopeners would still be available. Thanks, Simon. I follow that. I suppose it goes back to that smaller programs of work, though. And if you've got dramatic uptake, say, of process heat at a smaller scale because of incentive that's been given, um, that's outside of legislation or regulatory. Um, mechanisms then you're still left without having forecast for that and no response in the regime mm -hmm. so uh, again similar to the dale point in terms of the the ability to uh, accumulate projects to make up a program of work for multiple smaller smaller pieces of work which weren't previously forecast as the challenge yeah that's right yeah. okay Back to you, Thanks for highlighting, Rachel. Got one more question. And it's from Donna. Hi. Hi, it's Donna White here from Top Energy. I just had a question with, you know, the bit of uncertainty while we wait for these decisions to be made, whether we need to rejig our CapEx forecast. There's obviously going to be a need, perhaps for some, to go down the reopener path. And I know you've noted there that you're you're addressing the volume issue, but once you have addressed that, what sort of turnaround time are you aiming for to be the sort of standard for a reopener? Thanks, Donna. Um, so we we heard a lot about this um, in the IM review about timeframes. Um, we've not set. Uh, Timeframes by which we, you know, we have to respond. Uh, other than to say that we're, we're working as we'll be working as swiftly as possible. Um, 
The other thing to note as well is that the reopener process has only been tested once. We've only had one reopener uh, been put through the process. And I think as as we um, get more experience at these, um, you know, it, it'll be easier for us to to try and come up with some sort of uh, time frame guidelines, uh, but there's nothing in there at the moment. Um, and and what I would encourage businesses to do is to engage early, as early um, with us as possible. Thank you. But understand the the concerns about time frames. Okay, I think we probably need to move on from the slide because we're running a bit late. Um, so we'll move on to LCCs now. So as an alternative um, optional mechanism to a reopener, um, for large new customer initi initiated connections, we introduced the LCC mechanism during the IM review. So that is available for DPP4. Um, for connections that meet certain criteria, uh, which are in the sub bullet points under the first bullet, uh, which includes thresholds. So for expenditure to be eligible for future LCCs, it must not already have been provided for in DPP allowances, which means that um, these need to be clearly identified. So we realize that the timing of the IM review final decisions meant that the requirement of identifying um, connection expenditure that would have been eligible for LCCs, uh, businesses would not have known in time for, for AMP 2023, nor the response to the S53 ZD notice. So uh, understand that it might be challenging for AMP 2024. So this is not a topic that we are, uh, we've, identified um, for further discussion in the breakout session shortly, but this is a, a question that we'd really like um, some views on in your in written subs. And what we'd like to explore with you is how best practically can this information be identified uh, within information that you've already disclosed to us, i.e. AMP 23, um, or information that is forthcoming, which is in AMP 2024. And because this is not a topic for the breakout discussion um, that we're going to start soon, um, I'd also encourage you, um, if you have any questions or comments on the LCC mechanism itself, um, feel free to include those also in written submissions. How are we doing for time, Dean? Um, just wondering whether I should pause for a quick question, if not. Uh, we are running a little bit over time, Sapna, so I okay. suggest that we're, uh, there's further questions around reopeners in terms of the scope and application. Uh, we're happy to pick up that with EDBs and others um, following the session, and particularly if you've got specifics, as um, others have said, um, early engagement's always best. Thanks, Dean. Um, if you do have any burning questions on this, uh, on, on the LCC, can I just suggest that you pop them in the chat so that we've got a record of them. So I think now I'll hand you over to Fungi who will speak to deliverability and additional reporting. Kirakoto, um, my name is Fungai Sibanda, I'm Chief Advisor in the Regulatory performance team. As indicated, the next topic is deliverability, um, by which we mean the ability by EDBs to deliver on their work program. So in the issues paper, we expressed our concern that EDBs may not be able to deliver on the expanded work program in the face of labor market and um, supply chain um, constraints. And thank you very much for all the submissions and cross submissions that we received. Um, and having looked at the submissions, we we do recognize that um, individual EDBs are taking measures to 
respond to the deliverability um, challenge. Um, however, we remain concerned that from a sector-wide perspective, it may be difficult for EDBs to, um, to deliver on the elevated work program if they are all looking for and competing for the same skills at the same time, um, whether it's in the local market, um, within the region, or even globally. And um, moreover, the the competition for skills also cuts across um, sectors and um, uh, industries. Um, so we also looked at uh, independent reports on labor market constraints. Um, and these reports indicate ongoing um, labor shortages. Uh, also locally, uh, regionally, and, and internationally. And of particular interest is the OECD report that says these shortages began way before the pandemic, um, got worse uh, post the pandemic, and are actually likely to continue into the um, foreseeable uh, future. We also had regard to the recent um, uh, Transpower uh, Independent Verifier report, where the Independent Verifier expressed concern um, regarding um, Transpower's ability to recruit about um, 200 workers um, over, over the next three years. Um, again, pointing to a constrained um, labor market. And this is over and above what um, Transpower's contractors might, might require as well. Um, so in the issues paper, we asked stakeholders how um, our CAPEX framework should consider or take into account um, um, the sector-wide deliverability uh, constraints. Um, and the responses that we received can be grouped into three main um, categories. So there are those um, who have indicated that the low-cost nature um, of the DPP regime does not um, allow for project-level um, scrutiny. And therefore, the Commission will be um, unable to assess um, deliverability uh, challenges. Um, then there are other submitters who indicated that the EMS already um, account for deliverability, and therefore it is not necessary for the um, Commission to, um, to do so. They also expressed the view that much of what we see in the capex step change is cost driven as opposed to um, volume of work um, however our um, analysis um, shows that the focus investment appears to be driven by the need to increase um, work volumes but we we'll want to pick up on this point um, during the discussion um, session, but are also requesting um, written feedback on it, uh, backed by um, particular evidence and, and, and analysis. Um, and then there were also views that, well, the concerns that uh, we, we express stem, for the, um, stem from the um, COVID pandemic and uh, that the global markets are actually uh, easing up. And then we had the uh, the last group of um, submitters, mostly these were retailers as well as the major electricity um, users group, who suggested that um, the Commission should make a deliverability um, adjustment or find mechanisms to, um, to account for um, deliverability. So our emerging view is that perhaps we should um, consider um, deliverability 
alongside uh, need timing and cost when we uh, make adjustment to account for, for uncertainty. And we would like your, um, your views and um, thinking around this um, during the discussions. Um, and also, as you will be aware, um, we had commissioned an independent review of the 2023 EMS. And when it comes to the ability by EDPs to deliver on forecast expenditure, the M review report could not give us assurance that EDPs have uh, factored in deliverability um, in their in their focus. Um, but instead, the report indicates that there are likely to be um, delivery challenges. Um, given the size of the forecast uh, work program. Um, and, 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 and so as, as, as already indicated, um, our, our early thinking is that uh, perhaps we should then consider um, deliverability as part of um, uncertainty alongside need, timing and cost, instead of um, considering it as a, a, a separate um, factor on, on, on its own. Now, um, so given all these um, concerns that we have around uh, the ability to, to deliver by EDPs, and to the extent that the uh, forecast expenditure is driven by um, the, the size of the work program, um, our early thinking is that they are likely to be uh, delivery challenges. Uh, and as such, uh, we are thinking that it may be beneficial to specify um, additional reporting requirements um, for those EDBs uh, with an elevated um, work program. Um, and the additional reporting requirements um, could take the form of an annual um, delivery report. Um, and I'm glad that this has been touched on and it's a good point that was raised that perhaps um, this needs to be a, some form of targeted um, reporting um, instead of reporting on um, on everything. Um, also, um, rec recognizing that um, EDBs already do undertake some form of um, reporting um, in terms of the information disclosure um, determination. So the ADR um, should perhaps be just additional targeted um, uh, reporting. Um, and the idea really behind an ADR is that um, consumers as well as the commission um, should have a way of um, monitoring and assessing um, whether and how EDBs um, um, delivering against the uh, forecast um, work program. And of course, um, EDBs will also have a way of um, reporting on delivery and uh, providing reasons where they are um, where they are not um, able to um, to deliver. Um, so this is the um, early thinking that we are having around um, deliverability as well as um, the annual um, delivery uh, reporting. Um, so we we do have questions um, for for submission and we will request um, your written uh, feedback. Um, but we'll then um, move on to um, a discussion. Um, around um, deliverability as well as um, additional uh, reporting uh, requirements. So as previously mentioned, um, we're not going to be going into breakout rooms. So this is an all up um, forum to talk through the 
deliverability and additional reporting requirements questions. And Funga and I will be co-facilitating this. We've got something from Jonathan to start with. Oh, so I've got sort of uh, two questions or comments to well, hopefully kick this session off. Um, first of all, um, you mentioned that I'll say, you know, deliverability risks mean that you have concerns that EDBs can receive elevated profits by not delivering on projects. So that's sort of the risk that you're trying to address here. But you also mentioned that, you know, this isn't something new. This is something that COVID has had an impact on, et cetera. Do you have any historical evidence or analysis that can sort of show where EDBs haven't been able to deliver projects because of these um, because of these constraints in the past? Yeah, so, so sorry. Yeah, so what we did is we looked at um, previous um, expenditure. Um, and um, when we looked at the 2023 um, AMPs as well as the draft 2024 um, AMPs, um, we saw um, this step change, um, which has not been um, there in the in the past uh, uh, period, um, and so that indicated to us that um, perhaps there could be a, a delivery uh, problem, um, considering that there are all these um, labor market uh, challenges, um, and if we have this elevated work program and everybody's looking for um, the same skills at the same time. Um, how is that going to um, uh, assist in terms of, uh, of deliverability? So um, yes, um, so comparing the past period um, and the current or the DPP uh, four period, we sort of like um, uh, uh, um, found that there's, there's, there's this particular um, uh, elevation or increased um, uh, forecast, um, which has not been there in the in the past period, and and that um, uh, that that is where the concerns. Are. Just j jumping on that one uh, as well, I, I guess the um, the overall significant increase in spend um, and is kind of what gives us rise to asking the question and a bit of history around. I guess the EDBs have undertaken undertaken significant increases in investment programs. Sort of particularly particular relevance is the CPPs more recently, and the annual delivery reports which come from that, and the amount of work and time required to actually gear up in advance to deliver elevated work programs, and then you know the the ongoing delivery of it. So we think it's a re relevant question to ask. We can go back and sort of unpick historics, but it does appear that. Um, you know what is currently ahead of us is a significant uplift in investment, which hasn't been seen in more recent okay. years. Okay, so it is something you're expecting going forward. Yep. Cool. Thank you. Would anyone like to um, offer a view in some of the questions that are up on the screen? Go ahead, Keith. Yeah, my question's really um, on this um, reporting side of things. There is obviously quite a lot of detail already within the IDs on the quantum works get undertaken. If you look at sort of the some of the reporting in there around poll numbers and so forth, where it does actually look at the movement in number of things per year. So I was just wondering. Um, making sure we use the data that's already reported and available um, and rather than creating new reporting burdens on EDBs um, and noting that there is already compliance reporting, um, annual delivery um, annual delivery reports, annual compliance statements and so forth. So wondering whether it's um, additional reporting requirements as a standalone thing will add any value or whether they should be incorporated in existing frameworks. So I think that's more or less in line with our thinking as well, is that given that this is a DPP, um, we should try and make use of 
existing information as much as possible. My only concern is, I mean, if we rely on, I mean, the, the main beneficiary of this information is for consumers who will be wanting to to see, uh, you know, for for increases in 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 uh, electricity prices, whether um, investments are are being delivered, and with, I guess my question is how how many consumers would go looking in ID for that information, and are we not better off? Uh, providing information to them in a lean, low-cost way, uh, in a simple way that will enable to, in, enable them to, um, you know, to see if work programs are being delivered. Did you want to add to that something? Yeah, look, I think it's one of the um, points that we probably um, raised to say EDBs um, could assist. Um, by indicating what kind of information do you currently report on, um, which could then be um, used um, for, um, um, or which could be adopted um, in a, you know, uh, for reporting in a in a targeted manner um, to to assist in terms of assessing um, whether um, uh, EDPs are actually um, delivered delivering on the on the planned um, work program. Um, so perhaps it's something that um, you you could assist in terms of coming back to us um, to say, look, um, this is how we think um, this might uh, this might work. Yeah, that's, that's a good point, Keith. We're very aware under our um, performance and understanding and summary analysis powers of making great use of the information which EDBs do spend a lot of time providing. So we will definitely be doing that. I think potentially one of the big distinctions here is the explanatory story related to why delivery may have been different than planned, which might not come through in sort of some of the more um, schedule-based disclosures. Questions. Um, it's a question from Evan, I think, in the chat. Okay. Russell, if you've got a question for us. Uh, it's more of a comment than a question. Um, rather than crush us all with additional reporting on top of the reporting we've got, it seems to me that that increase in expenditure, uh, according to your slide 56, is driven by system growth. And then if you refer back to slide 45 on system growth, it's actually driven by five or six companies. Uh, and I would urge you to focus on those customers uh, or those companies that are driving it rather than impose something on all of us. Thanks for that comment, Russell. I mean, we are looking at targeted ways of doing this, so that comment's quite helpful. Not us, it's driving it. It's just reporting for reporting's sake. Russell, while you're there, Sean here, yeah, you had, you had to speak up. Deliverability up north and, and delivering your large projects, how are you finding it? Uh, we're still getting it done, but it is impacting on the price of delivered projects. So um, going to the market for competitive tenders, it's more difficult to get, it, get pricing at all. And um, pricing we are getting has gone up significantly um, in the order of 28% compared to last year. So that's a competitive tendering process for reliability projects post Gabriel, uh, where we went to five and we got pricing from one. Thank you, thank you. I noticed Rhino's online as well, and I always love asking Rhino a question. And the same question goes for you, Rhino, on your on Powco's delivering. What what are you finding there? Right. <laughs> You're talking specifically around the um, and your delivery report type delivery. Just at, at your delivery all, all, all oh, over. Delivery all and because and, and you've had quite a yeah. big works um, yeah. program as well. well. Well, we've had the benefit, of course, of preparing for a customized price path which um, application, which did give us a, a run up. And, and to be fair, even the first possibly one, two years of, of the CPP was spent in ramping up that workforce. So right now, it, um, 
we are in a position that we're quite comfortable about the delivery of our next asset management plan because we've got the resources in place. But I do share the overall concern that, that you've raised that that um, if if all companies or, or a large number of companies have to go through that same lift up that, that we've gone up, up and, and additional resources we've had to develop, uh, it is likely to put significant strain on, on the industry. And it's not just construction. I mean, we're talking at all levels from from the, the planners and, and the project managers and the designers and, and, and then through to, to the construction teams. I'm just conscious of the time. We're just running uh, two minutes to scheduled close. Um, I know that a, f a few more hands are up, and um, if I can, if I can just encourage you to pop your questions in the chat, so we've got a record of them, and you'll have an opportunity to submit through submissions. Thanks very much for all of your questions and comments. Really uh, useful and appreciated. I now like to hand over to Simon, who's going to take us through other issues. Thank you. Thanks, Sapna. If you don't mind controlling the slides, we'll just rip through this really quickly. Um, there's been a couple of other components of the CapEx framework, which we haven't discussed today, which were questions we raised uh, on the issues paper on submission. So if you just jump to the next slide, Sapna. Um, we haven't stated specific questions on this, but happy for your comments to be provided. We've touched on resilience today and we acknowledge it's really important, but I guess our viewers, we're not needing to treat it as a separate category to assess itself. Um, and the other thing to touch on at the bottom there is the CGPI, the Consumer Capital Goods Price Index. Um, there's been talk about needing to adjust upwards, backwards um, data sets. So that's really interesting to get sort of specific uh, evidence from EDBs about cost increases and how we could inflate up historics to make that relevant. And then actually there's a lot of distinction between sort of constant and nominal and EDBs forecasts, which indicate that you're not using CG, uh, CGP in a consistent way. So that might be another one which is really worthwhile kind of getting some further views on. Um, I'm going to pass to Dane to work to close out the session. Cool. Um, just first off, uh, a huge thank you uh, for everyone who's made themselves available today. Uh, we really appreciate the time to talk through some of the issues. Um, uh, hopefully that has got uh, the ball rolling um, in your minds ticking over on uh, your views. Uh, just a quick reminder that the slides and also a recording of the workshop will go up on our website, hopefully not too long after the close of the session. And then uh, I think it's the 11th of March is the target date for getting back your written submissions on this. Um, and also thanks to the team. Um, uh, just really appreciate the hard work you put into hitting this deadline to get something up and the conversation is running. Um, I will just, I think now onto the next slide, I think might be the karakia for close. Cool. Kahiki te tapu kia watea aitiara, kia turuki aitiao marama, uie takie. Thank you very much again, everybody. <laughs>